Um, so guys, uh, East Sleep Train Podcast, I'm on the couch with the two other original founders of Dominance, um, uh, Dave Krishich, aka Big Dave, uh, and for those of you that can actually are uh, watching this on YouTube, you can understand why he's Big Dave and I'm Little Dave, uh, and Cameron. Uh, so we're actually chatting a little bit about uh, the history of, of Dominance, uh, but I wanted to start off a little bit before that because I think in order to get... Uh, a good history of, of where the gym started, it's probably important to understand where each individual person started. Um, which one of you guys started training first? I can't... I, I think I did. Tim what, Cam, Cam started training with John first. I was uh, about 94. a year later. Yeah. So why don't we start with you? Okay. Tell your story. And, uh, and we'll just sit back and take the piss out of you. Yeah, why not? It's, I will not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's changed. Yeah, no. Uh, started in 94 with John in Geelong. Uh, trained for about five or six years in Geelong to Purple Belt and then... Wait, like back up a little bit. Why, why, okay. Why'd you actually start training? Why'd you start training? Uh, well, originally I did karate for I think about two years and hated it. Uh, Why'd you hate it? I was 10 and it was scary. It was, you know, big guys, you know, all this sternness and another language. And mm. I'm just this little kid from Cryo and it was a little bit, and I just found it very confusing. And why'd you start it? Because I always had a, I always liked martial arts for some reason. I don't yeah. know. I always had like, I remember like, <laughs> probably sharing too much, but my mother got, you know, getting me PJs with a karate guy on it or something. There's always yeah. something about it that I liked. How old, wait, you're 10. Yep. What, Year was that, 1960? <laughs> Close. No, I was 10, so 84. 84, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so the late 80s is, like, karate's big then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah kickboxing. Yeah. That was back in the days of, um, I can't remember the competition, but, you know, they, they, they had the uh, the kickboxing fights in the ring and they wore the shiny, like, tracksuit that pants. Was the, the PKA rules. Thank the you. The above waist Yeah, rules. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so... You started it because you were wearing karate pajamas, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there had to be more to it than that, right? I just, I like, I liked it. Um, I suppose, jeez, um, man, you're asking a long, long time ago. Um, I think, yeah, I just wanted to do karate. I think I remember Mum saying, "Oh, there's a guy at work. He's a he's a black belt in karate. Do you want to give it a go?" And I'm like, "Sure, cool." And went along and did that. Um, Stuck it out for about two years and I just found, I remember doing my last grading and it was all in Japanese and I, I think I passed. Well, I did pass and I'm like, I'm done. That's what just, was the belt for? I think it was like second red. In, yep. Yeah, if I remember, you know, it was just the first, first colored belt. They got their belts the other way around to us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. karate for a couple of years, stopped doing it, not really into the vibes. A no. uh, little bit of a, a break, I should. Yeah, well, yeah. And then, uh, you know, being a, then, you know, High school teenager, played tennis for a number of years through there, a bit of surfing. Um, and then I was playing pool uh, in Geelong at a pool hall and I saw John's gym across the road. And it's funny, I'd actually gone looking for his gym when it used to be in the wheat, there used to be wheat silos in Geelong and it was underneath there and I heard kids talking. <laughs> that sounds it. shady as yeah. fuck. Oh, well, it kind of was because I heard kids, I heard like in year 11 or 12, Kids talking about this really awesome training. Um, you know, this guy, he trains, you know, it was, um, I can't remember the street anymore. But yeah, it was just like, it's under the wheat silo. So I went down there once I got my driver's license to check it out and I couldn't find it. Um, so I kind of let it go for then. Um, and then it wasn't until I was playing pool at this pool hall that I saw like shoot fighting, big yellow sign, shoot fighting there. And I'm like, I'll go there when I get a full-time job and I can afford it, I'll go there. It's, so it's on, is it Malop Street? Malop Street. Malop Street. Yep, it's, been, it's been there. The same time. place, still yep. there. And so, um, sure enough, got a job. A couple months later, I walked up and, you know, I still remember they had this little old TV up hanging from the roof and they pl play a video and uh, it was a couple of the students and John doing striking, takedowns, fighting on the ground. And I'm like, oh, this has got everything. You know, for me, that was what I thought, like, oh, stand up and ground. I was never really 
attracted to weapons. This is like back that. in the day when he's he's running shoot fighting, not yeah, that's not right. jiu-jitsu. It's before, not even split off yet. Before he split the styles. Yep. And uh, first night, went in. Yep, that's it. I'm on. And I actually remember them going, you sure? You, you don't want to try? I'm like, nah, nah. Membership, gi, I'm good to go. Yep. And uh, from there, I think it was about two years after that, I think it was after Jean-Jacques came out, did a seminar that he spoke to John and said, look, you really need to do straight standalone jits. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's where he split it. What year is this? 96, yep. I think it was. Um, and then, so we went into two separate, you could either do shoot fighting or BJJ. And I, d- I continued doing both. Yep. So continued, got to like, up, up through the ranks. I think at that time you've been training for about two, two and a half years. John did a switch over like you're a blue belt. Mm-hmm. Okay. So blue belt then. Um, and then, yeah, I think yeah, about 99, 2000 was when I got my purple. Yep. And then shortly after that, went to Melbourne. Yeah, you moved to Melbourne and you're training out of the, the Richmond gym, which is where we met. Yep. Um, yeah. That's probably a pretty good place to leave it. Yeah. You were training, did you start Ke- Kensington All-Stars, I'm going to say? Right, so... Or did, wait, let's go back. Did you do anything before that? Or was that your yes. first? Yeah. Um, growing up in my family, <laughs> uh, you it was, it was mandatory man skills. You had to learn to defend well, can, yourself. Yeah, your old man's a cop. Yes. Retired, I assume. He's retired now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, Sir Lunch a lot uh, ended up retiring. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like Santa Claus now, and my, yep. my kids have got him wrapped around their little finger. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so even my grandfather, he used to box mm-hmm. in the Serbian army, you know, way back when. So that yep. was. Which is that? To, yeah. So you, that's that's your background, which <laughs> explains the lack of vowels in your surname. Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, S- Serbian uh, Scrabble uh, yep. just doesn't work out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, even my grandfather, he, when I was little, I, re- I remember my first lesson, um, you, you know, distinctly to this day. Uh, keep your hands up, keep your chin down, keep your punches straight, and don't be afraid to hit anybody. Yeah. I was four. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was that was the standard operating procedure, yep. you know. Um. So anyway, I, I had always grown up around it. Yep. And at nine years old, I ended up doing my cursory sort of training in martial arts with a, a fellow called Bryce Birdwhistle who ended up training Dale Westerman. Oh, there you go. Both I know, know. Yeah, I know Westy. Um, Shout out Dale Westerman. Him and, and Louis Isofides and all those guys. And yep. he had a, a like a karate style, which is a mix of karate and taekwondo. And then he yep. made the transition to kickboxing as, as, as many people did. Mm-hmm. I didn't do that for too long. Um, you know, Wait, this chubby little n- nine-year-old. You so know. you're doing the karate, taekwondo kind of hybrid? Yes. And did you go through into the kickboxing transition with him as well? No, okay. I didn't. Um, you know, it, it was, I was easily discouraged. I wasn't the most confident child. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got, you know, bullied a lot and all that sort of stuff. And then you had this room full of guys that, I was the youngest in a room class full of adults. I was nine. Yep. So... You know, they're sparring and they're, they're holding back. But for a nine-year-old, a kick in the guts is a kick in the guts. You know, mm-hmm. so... Yeah, man. Um, you know, you can, you can kick it out of them, but you can't kick it back in. So, yep. it's like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was discouraged and I, and I gave it away, as, as yep. many little kids do, yep. you know. Um, then later it's on... It's funny, sorry to interject this. It's funny, though, that in a lot of the traditional martial arts, there's an acceptance that you can beat the shit out of kids when you're an adult. Yeah. I'm um, not saying it's it's the most common experience but it's definitely common that, it's common enough yeah that it's it's problematic i would say i agree yeah it's absolutely in any other situation it wouldn't be okay for for a grown man to kick the shit out of a nine-year-old <laughs> but but you got to remember it was the 80s and no one cared no that's well that's exactly right that's true everything was okay in the 80s um so later on through high school you know like i was a i i, I got subject to a lot of bullying mm-hmm um, even as, as big as I was, I, my confidence was not, was not good. Do you think that, that, that was, you know, big kid, oh man, got a bit of an edge. This kid's not, you know, let's make a point. Yeah, I think there was some of that for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, I, I don't know why, but ultimately that, uh, uh, an incident where a friend of mine was kicked in the head at the shops, just, at, um, up the street from my high school, I thought, and this is jumping off the chain pretty badly. I've got to do something. Yep. 
So I was about 13 or 14 at the time. Yes, it's like year, year eight, year nine. Year eight, year nine. Yep. And um, I joined up to do Tang Sudo with uh, Master Ivan Tay. He was teaching out of the local What's um, What's church. Tang Sudo? It's... It's like Korean karate. It's yep. the, sort of the alternative to taekwondo, yep. so to speak. What's the what's the, I mean, I did taekwondo for a few years, and it's it's very heavily kick focused. Um, this is more um, hands focused. Yep. yep, I would say. I think I'd say it's sort of fifty fifty. Yep, um, and a lot of that the or what the Japanese would call kata. Yep, um, are actually the same in Tang Sudo as they are in certain karate styles as well. I noticed that with the first, at least one or two patterns, because I went, I did Taekwondo through to a certain point and then went and trained with a buddy who did karate. And when we're doing some of the kata, I'm like, this kata is exactly the same. How the fuck does that, you know, like <laughs> in my head, I'm like, this, this is not supposed to be the same, what? And then I, then I was kind of like, hang on, there's something going on here. There's, there's a lot of shared heritage there yeah, too. Yeah. Um, even though they, they historically disliked each other, there, yeah. there was a lot of cross-training going on. Yeah. I mean, Masayama was part Korean. Yeah, you know that, that, that <laughs> like the the punch block H, H pattern. I think it was called like it's yeah, the very first one. Sort that of pretty, pretty cool. It's a pretty standard yeah. thing. Um, so anyway, I I really got into it. My my spark for that was ignited, and then I started really getting into it. So anything I could get my hands on. Yeah, and some friends of my father's. My my dad was a, an instructor trainer at the Victorian Police Academy with mm-hmm. the FOST unit. It was called the FOST unit back then. Um, they've, they've changed the name to make it less, you know, firearms focused. It used yep. to be Firearms Operational Survival Training Unit. Now it's different. Peace, uh, love and <laughs> happiness <laughs> unit. You know, the, the political, the you know, the fun police got to it and changed it. Um, and uh, guys that you would remember... Um, uh, Junior Johnson and Mowgli Martin, yep. um, John and and uh, Les jo- Les Johnson. Uh, they gave me. They came over to my house because they, they were working with my dad and uh, these grainy VHS tapes of John in the wheat silo. <laughs> <laughs> right. There we go, go. Um, <laughs> because they were training with him at the yes. time. Yep. And John Martin said something that changed my life at that moment. He said, "If you like martial arts, this is the future." He handed me a. Tape, a VHS tape. Um, it was this was in 1993, mm-hmm. so it was UFC one. Well, it would have had to be the end of like pretty close to the end of 93. Yeah, because UFC one was in 93. Was in 93. Yep. So this was this was sort of sort of the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, UFC one, Gracie's in action. Yeah, <laughs> and the the demonstration film that John put together. Yep. Man, we gotta we gotta see if. John keeps stuff. He's got to have that demonstration he's, film. He's he's a collector. He's got it. Somewhere. He's got it somewhere. <laughs> he's got it somewhere. We're gonna have you to peer pressure him. Um, and so I, I watched that and I was like, "This is it. This is this is the stuff." Yep. And I'm, you know, a, a young teenager, time, fifteen, sixteen years old. Um, and I actually had my first lesson. Then, so it was like early '94. So that's that's with Moog's, yes, at your house, basically. No, we we were the Kensington had just opened. So the Kensington All Stars was was that at the Lombards building? Am I getting that right? No, um, the the Lombards building was where Victoria Ranges, the climbing gym, was, and there was a shooting range there as well. Correct. And you you and I went climbing there a couple a couple of times. You were much more into than I was. Yes. But that building's no longer there. That building's no longer there. Um, that was run by a fellow called George Haitley, who was a, a former um, <laughs> SOG yep. guy. Um, hence the pistol shooting, all that sort of stuff. Yep. And that's where John's first Melbourne school was. Gotcha. Then my, who would become my boss later on, uh, Scott opened up a place in Kensington, which wasn't far from there. Yep. It was a couple of clicks um, near the Kensington train station just mm-hmm. you're not too far from the North Melbourne Housing Commissions. Yep. And um, I, I did my first lesson there. And I, I, I actually did that as a subject of a little seminar class at my school. It's like, this is the very first lesson I ever did. And, That's I, pretty and cool. I taught it and um, it was really cool. So John Martin. So this was 94. You've gone to um, yep. to All Stars. <laughs> right. was, was it called Kensington All Stars back then? Um, it was actually called the Australasian Martial Arts Centre. It was actually pretty ahead of its time. Yeah. You know, there was... Shit name. No disc. 
Ter- All Stars is way better. Right? It was like, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. but that, it was home to the Kensington All Stars, which gotcha. was an extension of the Fitzroy Stars gym. Yep. Where one of my kickboxing trainers was the head trainer. That was Dana Goodson. He's passed away since. Yep. Um, Dana's a legendary coach as well. Oh, yeah. Tough guy, too. Probably the most dangerous guy inside one round I have ever personally witnessed. <laughs> and I have some great stories for that. Um, so anyway, time goes on. I couldn't get out there because I didn't have a car. I was a teenager and it was I lived in Doncaster. So you'd done your first lesson though. Like what the experience of that is you're walking, you do your first lesson and you walk away, you're like, poof, like, oh my God, this is the thing. That's or, it. So I practiced on everyone. And yep. they, consent was not a thing. I was going <laughs> to say, were they, were they aware that you were practicing on them? Or right. Was and it surprise is, practice? Uh, surprise practice. <laughs> you know, I practiced with my dad a little bit when he was home and stuff. And, um, but I, and I was still doing the, the Tang Sudo training. And then I was, I was doing stuff that you weren't supposed to do. Like yep. How old are you at this stage still? 15 or yeah, 16. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, so still, so still early awesome. 94, I turned 16. Yep. Um, yeah, I should know that. We're the same age, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, two, like two days apart, or whatever it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's right. January, January kids. Yep. Um, so I, I'm in Tang Sudo class, and it comes to sparring, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I can do some stuff. It's like the angel and the devil. <laughs> oh, that, the angel. The angel was on a leave of absence <laughs> at that point because you know at that time in my life too. It's, it's interesting with bullying. Um, bullies are created. Yeah. And how they are created is, in my opinion, I have no evidence to back this up. <laughs> this is just my opinion. Um, a, a bully has their confidence stolen mm-hmm. and confidence being a commodity in this particular context. Their, their confidence is stolen. So the person who had their confidence stolen realizes that that's probably the quickest, easiest way to get it back. Mm -hmm. And they become bullies. And this is firmly where I was at that point. Yeah. And I was now, I was in possession of skills that they did not have. Yep. And I was throwing leg kicks and elbows. I did it in a grading. I got in trouble and I was denied my grading. And <laughs> but you're like, I don't care. It was like, elbows are worth more than belts. I, I still whooped your ass. You know? um, Glory forever. Which was, which was, in retrospect, horribly disrespectful. And if, and of if, course. If, and if Master Tay is actually in some way going to get possession of this, I do apologize. That was terrible. But it's um, it, we laugh at it. But, but looking back on it, because there is... You know, hindsight 2020, you understand the context that that all sits in. So you can actually go, mm. oh, this experience happened to me. And the only way that I knew how to get it back was to to take it from someone else. Right. Um, and it, it's it's a horrible cycle. And I'm glad through jujitsu I was able to overcome it. Do you think, we'll segue for a little moment, but do you think the difference between a striking art and a grappling art, so I feel like there's more room for striking arts to create for to create bullies or for bullies to continue being bullies because striking by its nature is is i hesitate to use a phrase but it's more violent it demands a certain level of aggression there we go it also demands uh physical capability so if you are larger stronger and more athletically capable than someone else you're going to have an advantage Mm -hmm. even if you're not as big as that person if you're a little bit more aggressive if you're a little bit more athletic, yeah. you can really put the wood on someone and there's no nice way to hit anybody. Yeah. You either hit them or you don't. Yeah. So and and you are in fact encouraged mm-hmm. to be aggressive. Yep. And then there's the confusion model, particularly when you're teaching kids. Yeah. Yes, kick, punch, aggressive, go, go, go. Don't use this on your sister. Don't use this at school. It's like mm-hmm. so then what do you do? All right. So there's there was a lot of that going on. Yep. And I you know, I I ended up sort of disqualifying myself from that school. And then I finished... Wait, wait. What does that mean? <laughs> what that means is <laughs> I, I had a, a, a very good friend, um, David Price, and he's he lives in Queensland now. Uh, shout out to Dave if you're watching. I hope you are. Um, I actually brought him to the mat at one point. Yeah. And uh, he, he never took it up, but he, he dug it. 
uh, he was he was a bit rough around the edges too. You know, he was he he liked to he liked to scrap a little, and um, so we got along. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was it was like we we were we were sparring, we were going at it, and I was I was not a black belt or anything. I think I was a green belt or something at the time. Yeah, I don't Against know where Tang that. Tang Sudo was talking about. Yes. So. Yep. Uh, and I I I was at a point where I was doing extra training. I was training at home. I had a bag. I had it all set up. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad helped me out with that because he saw my, you know, my passion for it and, you know, sort of fed that. Yep. And I was doing all the extra training. I was getting up in the morning, skipping, you know, I was doing all my carters and stuff in the backyard. I was doing all of that. And I was putting in, and without hyperbole, I was putting in at least three times the amount of effort that everybody else was. Yeah. Yet, when it came to that particular incident uh, at that grading, I was supposed to go up, and I, and it wasn't just me that said this. My friend Dave said, "Dude, you you killed it." Yeah. You know that I was consistently outperforming not only my peers but even guys that were a little ahead of me mm-hmm. yet my attitude was the thing that was holding me back. And instead yep. of explaining that to me, they just, they did the classic traditional martial arts thing. We're not going to tell you anything and that's it. Isn't that an interesting element that exists in, in a lot of traditional martial arts? It's mm. like you, like you kind of left to just try to figure it out, like wander around aimlessly, like, like what the fuck did out. I do wrong? Yeah. Right. So I wasn't, I, I was rebuked for doing certain things like throwing elbow strikes and gratings just yep. was one that, you know, I got pulled up for, but nothing else. Yeah. So it was, it was apparently a very hotly discussed topic among the, the senior members. Mm. And, you know, Dave was then told to let me know. He's like, look, we're happy you're doing all this extra training, but you, you gotta be cool. And I thought, it's at that point that I'm actually, and in my 17-year-old brain, I'm saying, well, I'm being punished for trying harder than everybody else. Mm-hmm. That's stupid. <laughs> yep. Right? Which, had it been explained that it was more my attitude than my action, yeah, maybe I would, I, I don't know if I would have changed anything, but at that point on, and then John was the guy that you went to see if you didn't care about any of that stuff and yeah. you wanted to learn to fight. Yep. Um. And at the end of, I just, I just was finishing year 12 so I could get on public transport and I would go out to Kensington. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started was, was around that time, 1995. Yeah. So 94, you did your first class. Can't do it just because of logistics. Yeah. Yeah. Logistics couldn't do it. Had your grading kind of finished up there and all right, this isn't the place for me to be. Time to move on. And in hindsight, probably would have been good for probably. Because if we fast forward to when... I did my first lesson. I did my first lesson, then I couldn't do it because of work, logistically as well. And then when I actually started training uh, at the the end of ninety seven, wait, ninety six, we did year twelve. I I finished year twelve ninety five. Ninety five. All right. No, whatever the first year was, I can't remember now. Um, that yeah, like did a class and then kind of couldn't start for the rest of the year because of work. But you were there then, and you were brutal, Dave. <laughs> oh yeah, and that was that was your nickname for some time, and and just. Like to put it in context as well, like that attitude of whatever was going on still existed there. And to be honest, it probably wasn't helped in that you're probably nudged in that direction by the other guys that were kind of in the gym. Because back in those days, when we're, now we're talking about when we're uh, John's Melbourne gym at this point is behind Richmond Station at uh, uh, muscle, muscle, and yeah, muscle and Body Shape. Well, that's that's that was, I, if I recall correctly, um, your first class was in Coppin Street. It was, yeah, yeah, it, it was. Um, but so I did that first class, and then I couldn't keep training because I was working right. for Clayton, so I was working evenings. And then he, Kensington had just moved to Coppin Street. I just missed, everyone assumes yeah. that I was at Kensington All Stars, and I just missed it by like a whisker. Mm. Uh, yeah, and then first class there when we ended up rolling, and that was one where I was wearing the basketball warm up pants. I remember the pants, I didn't remember it was you, <laughs> yeah. It was That's yeah, it was crazy, funny. <laughs> um, and it was it was a, the whole thing was pretty surreal. Like just all, it was funny because I'd I'd watched uh, I'd watched the UFCs as well. Like Clayton got hold of uh, UFC uh, one on VHS, and he also had Gracie in action. It must have been the same 
like stuff it probably was was came from the same bootleg. Yeah, like yeah. exactly. Yeah, so there's someone bootlegging it. And you get these really like a, a copy of a copy of a copy on a VHS. It's grainy, grainy as shit. Yeah, as an AV guy, it must have been an affront to your sense of professionalism. <laughs> like, oh, like, like, yeah, a copy this. of a copy is like you know. <laughs> yeah, just there was the uh, the other things that were going around. I don't know if it was the same time, but it was definitely around that time. Was the Mario Sperry instructionals, <laughs> that, <Right>. which <laughs> like next level politically incorrect. If you are to, to put them out now, <laughs> just just for just for those of you at home that haven't seen them, just get them. Just, it they're, just they're they're I'm fantastic. sure it's on YouTube somewhere. Uh, I'm sure it, it is. Mario Sperry's great mo- greatest moments. Funny for all the wrong reasons. That oh. there is. <laughs> there's a, no, there is. There's an edit of it. Um, Roger's looking for it now. Absolutely. I don't know. Fantastic. I don't know if we should link them up. But um, they're pretty funny. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it was uh, the watch this watch all the same stuff. But for some reason, when I showed up to that class and I'm watching what they're doing, I was a bit taken aback by it. And I'm saying to Clayton, I'm like, I'm not fucking doing that, man. Like, because it was the advanced class on first, and everyone's looking pretty rough. And you guys look like you're beating the shit out of each other. Well, and we I was were. like, yeah. And I was like, man, I'm gonna get killed. <laughs> <laughs> Which. Of course I would have because I was small as well and I didn't know anything and like just, I was like, man, these guys are getting fucked up. Like, <laughs> like how bad is it going to be for me? Um, but Clayton's like, come on, man, we're here. And I was like, nah, man. He's like, all right. They, they just, hurt. I'm like, all right, all right, we'll do it. And then we did, we did knee right armbar and it was like, I was sold from that moment. I was like, this is the shit. So mm-hmm. that was the technique portion of the class. But when it came to rolling, you and I ended up rolling and you were still brutal Dave and I, Again, I'm a fucking idiot, so I'm wearing tracksuit pants that have studs on the side that come off. <laughs> thinking, thinking that I'm playing for the... Sh- the it was this... That was San Antonio. I sp- I, man, I love those pants. I was, it was the 90s, man. It was the peak of NBA. That's it. And uh, so I was wearing... The, it's stupid. Like, I was coming to a grappling class. Mm-hmm. So yeah, partway through the wrestle, literally my pants had come off. They were 10 meters away. <laughs> and you and I are wrestling. And I was like, dude... Mate, my pants are over there. And you basically said something to the effect of, don't be a fucking pussy. It was that kind of... It, it might not have been that honest, those exact words, but honestly, that was definitely... It probably, at that time in my life, it probably sounds like something I would it say. Far it, off. it probably it wasn't those right words, but <laughs> it, it might have been something you're just like, like fucking, you know, and I was like, oh, Jesus right. Christ. Well, and I'm wearing I'm, like, I'm wearing boxer shorts too. Like not, <laughs> all the wrong. It's I know, all it, wrong. Was, it was wrong. And I was like, and I had that little moment where I'm like, what am I doing? But I still walked away going, man, I just learned how to break someone's arm tonight. Like Clayton and I walked out of that class going, holy this shit. Is it. You can do something <laughs> where you can break someone's arm. Like this is amazing. Yeah. And that, that knowledge, I still remember first learning all that stuff and it was intoxicating. I was like, holy yeah. shit. Well, we, it, sorry, go on. we had stuff that nobody else had. Yeah. And you'd mess around with your mates and you dominate them and you're like, holy cow. Yeah. I'm onto something. I'm, I really, like this is- you, you have like, six weeks worth of lessons and your mates that used to like mess with you are now getting strangled wholesale all over living room floors. And that's the difference, man. That's like, it's kind of like insider trading. You know what I mean? Like you've got this stuff that no one else knows until it's too late. Um, So that's like, we've kind of taken your journey through to the point where you've ended up uh, Kensington All-Stars. You've actually started trading. So here's the, here's the funny story about that. Uh, I did not do well in year 12, um, not because I'm unintelligent, it's just because I'm 17 years old and girls look better than assignments. Um, <laughs> yes, they do. But I did I did pretty well in examinations, but not in the assignments. And at yep. that time, it was very heavily assignment-based, so my TER was abysmal, yep. uh, to say the least. Um, and then my dad had he was moved to the force response unit and then he had a a uh, an officer under him who had opened this gym yep and that turned out to be scott buckner Mm -hmm. and that's that is where i met the world i ended up getting a job at that gym for a hundred bucks a week all stars we're talking about yes and i could train in anything i wanted Mm -hmm. that was part of the deal yep so I'd catch uh, two buses, two trains to get out there. Man, we're talk- that's actually not a bad deal. Like, because we're talking about the nineties, right? So I like, get- like this is twenty something years ago for the kids that are listening now. Hundred bucks, hundred bucks a week living for for a seventeen year old kid living yeah. at home is not so bad. Yeah, <laughs> and then I ended up I, I you know mop the mats, uh, empty spit buckets, and all that sort of stuff. But I got to train, mm-hmm. and which was right up my alley. That's all I really cared about, and that's where I met 
the world. Yep. Uh, I met John. I John Will, obviously. John yeah, there's will. a bunch of Johns. There are a bunch of Johns. John Will, to be specific. Uh, Dra- uh, Dana Goodson. Yep. Stan Longanides. Uh, Laos Tui, who's still around. Hey, Laos, Laos. Shout out Laos. Ran into him the other day. Still a legend. Laos, Laos a legend. Um, oh, man, I've got some stories about him, too. Uh, kicking dudes in the head and stuff. It's pretty funny. <laughs> it's not surprising um, at all. Uh, it, it, it really isn't. Uh, <laughs> if, 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 <laughs> no, that's, but that's that's where, you know, and, and at that time, jujitsu was something that if you were a martial artist, you did not necessarily qualify to do it simply because the martial arts, martial artists that valued that kind of knowledge were the guys that mingled on the rough side. Yeah. They were, they were really bleeding edge with they, their stuff. They prioritized effectiveness over tradition. Correct. Yeah, and, and etiquette. Correct. A- as did kickboxers yeah. and boxers at the time. It was, Which, like what you, it was a meritocracy. You were as good as you were. And it's, it's something that's very, very common in combat arts. When I say combat arts, I mean the ones that work tend to yes. prioritize that over formalities. Right, which is, which is very different from today. I think, you know, the... the as as jujitsu got more popular, I think that started to even out a little bit, in a good way, yeah. In, in a good way, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's and then we ended up moving Kensington to Coppin Street. Yeah, Coppin Street. How long were we at Coppin Street for? We I shouldn't say we. Long I because <laughs> 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 this is actually really funny. It was sort of tragic at the time, but it was really funny. Um, Scott, the the, the building. Mm-hmm. Lease. So Scott had this plan that he was going to move into the city and there was going to be multi-levels and, and he was a bit of an innovator. Yep. You know, he, he was thinking a little differently and the gym was sort of ahead of its time. Which is, it's that, that idea of like multiple levels, different style. It's common right. now. but It's common now, but back then it was like that 20, was just not being done. 25 years ago. Correct. Yeah, not happening. It just, it just didn't happen. He's basically so, the first MMA gym he's talking about. Right. And um, it would, it's a, so it's called a bridge and coppin and at that time it was... Movie Land or Video Easy? It was Movie Land. So it was Movie Land downstairs, and then and the gym was gym was in upstairs. The internal uh, stairwell up. But the only reason we ended up there was because a lease for the building in the city fell through. Gotcha. Last minute, and it was a last minute thing where we've got to relocate. So we relocated to there. And the funny thing about the floor on the first floor was basically the carpet was holding it up. <laughs> uh, so there was. There was all these, like, you know, we had a, a full, there was a weights gym and everything. We had all this equipment that had to be stacked in a corner because we couldn't use it because the floor wouldn't actually support the weight. Mm-hmm. And then when there was training going on upstairs, downstairs, the lights, those banks of mm-hmm. lights were <laughs> swinging like this, you know. Yep. So the owner of the store is like, uh, you guys can't stay. Yeah. So he he was cool. He and totally understandable too. Right. I, I mean, you can't have video falling yep. off the shelf and burying some little kid. <laughs> it's funny. I caught up with Scott last week. Oh really? And he was talking about John getting you guys to do star jumps and the walls coming in. He goes, <laughs> "We almost blew the windows out on the first night." <laughs> he just oh, it was it was actually really bad. Yeah. Um. How long, how long did things last at that location? It would have been about a year. Yeah, I was going to say, it or, couldn't have been any less. Though. He gave us enough time to find another spot. Yep. Um, so then Muscle and Body Shape came up, and mm-hmm. that's when they moved to Wangaratta Street near the Swan Street Station. And that's that's when the three of us ended up in the same place at the same time. Correct. Yeah. And uh, which, man, that it, it was it was pretty solid there like it was there was a lot of a lot of good guys on the mat but the, the vibe Tough there guys was too. the vibe there was really different yeah my experience of it and i i came in at, at the the tail end of it like the last few years of this before things started to shift a little bit and gym started to become a little bit more business orientated i think and it was basically we beat the shit out of everybody that comes in the door and if you're still around in a year's time maybe we'll start to show you some stuff. Now, not in the, in the context of the class. Like, John's still going to rock up and teach a class. But as far as your teammates go, and I say teammates in air quotes. You had to earn your way in. Definitely. Old school. It's old school. You got to earn your stripes. You got to take your lickings. And we, at that point, I would have imagined, I don't have the actual figures on it, but we would have had a 90% turn them away rate. People yep. would walk up the stairs, look at what was going on, turn around and go straight back down. And the people that and actually. That was, that was the same at Geelong too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it was. Because yeah, I used to go to Geelong a couple of times a week in a car that was worth less than a gi <laughs> by uh, today's reckoning. Uh, remember the old brown Ford that I used to have? Oh, God. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. 
I, I used to drive down there. I was like wondering if I was going to make it. Right. <laughs> it um. We had some good training sessions there. Yeah, just survive the drive, then the training, and then the trip. Well, there's home. no no ring road. <laughs> Perilous. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No yeah, ring yeah. road, and then we had all those guys like Chris. Oh, Thomas. Uh, Chris Chalmers. Ben Carlson. Yep. Yep. Dave Anthony Moore. Raduca, Dave ben Moore, Daryl Dando. Yep. Those guys were killers, man. Yeah. yeah. And they would take great pleasure in whooping us. Yep. Shout Bill out Chris Gray. Chalmers. Yeah. Bill Gray too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. My experience was Chris Chalmers was the the worst of them. But maybe <laughs> I think uh, no, the only reason I say it is because I think so. I'm going to fast forward a little bit in time, but we're we're at the hangar now, and we'll we'll come back. But this story I think is important. This will sum up Chris Chalmers. So Chris Chalmers has, has been brought in to teach classes once a week, and it was hard to get him to come in and teach because he's busy and he's got other stuff going on, and he's right. in Geelong, and he's like, oh, it's a ball like to get there. But the guys there ended up wrangling him into um to come and teach once a week, and I ended up getting a cauliflower ear just through training. It wasn't too bad. And Chris and I are having a roll, and I was like, I'm like, dude, can you just, you know, my ear? It's like the worst thing you could have said. Uh, It was the worst thing I said, (laughs) and the entire wrestle, he just smashed his elbow and forearm into my ear for an entire round, and it just went, (laughs) and got huge. And he was just just taking pleasure in it the whole time. He loved it. And then I ended up for basically the next two weeks after every class, laying on the reception desk, I said, and then the guys would drain it with a syringe and then you'd jump back in. I think I drained you yeah, with a syringe. Yeah, I think you did. That's, That's the why only, you look so beautiful. Uh, exactly. That's the only real bad cauliflower <laughs> I ever had. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> sending you my plastic surgery bills. Right, I, got, I got two that really sum up Chris as well. One was when, uh, when him and Dave Moore were going to do a uh, shooto over in Japan. Yeah. Early. Right. And they needed... They needed and junior. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And they needed a demo tape. And... and Chris is like, I need you to, I'm going to do some sparring, da, 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 da. Not knowing, he's got my back and he suplexed me. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck did that just happen? Like, I thought I was going to go out in a wheelchair. And the other one is when you go out, you like to get in a bit of trouble. Crown Casino? Sorry? Is this Crown Casino? No, this is Crown Casino. It just reminded me of another That was one. the Burswood Casino where he suplexed Junior oh, in the into gut, the in front the, lawn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Left a head dent in the lawn. Yeah. <laughs> I only ever heard, it, heard about that. Wasn't there. But what do you do to guy? Is he go? You're looking at my girl. <laughs> and the guy would go S- surprise. No, no, practice. no, no, and no. It, I'm not. No, I'm not. Why? What's wrong with her? Yeah. <laughs> and he just paint these poor bastards into a corner, and then he'd be able to start a fight. Yep, that sounds like Chris Thomas. <laughs> the other one, one more, is that he was. <laughs> I'm not going to say who brought it back from the states. It was going back and forth from the states at the time. Might have brought back some capsicum spray. <laughs> And he's like, we're going to see how this goes. So he's at the Lyric. He's kicked the door over some toilet and gone, shh, some dude walked away. <laughs> Next thing, this guy's walking out screaming like, ah, rolling around on the ground. That's Chris. <laughs> yeah. Well, Chris, Chris was, a, he was, he was just a, a, a wild dude. But Hilarious. he is a great guy. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, he if, he's, if he's in your corner, uh, if he, he's got your back. Yeah, he's, so he's one of those guys. I think I had... We've all had experiences with different people through training, right? And I think there's one way to sum up what kind of person someone is. And the way I think of it is if you're walking down the street and there's you and this person and five or ten guys rock up to you and, and it's going to be on, there's nothing you can do about it. If you turn around and whether or not that person's, your mate's still there, yeah. I think that's probably the best, like the two categories that people, Chris is the kind of guy who'd, he'd not only be there, he'd be like, Let's go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, he, he would be he would be like, all right, this is the plan. Yeah. yeah. But then you got other guys, you'd be like, where the fuck did he go? And you're like, all right, all right I guess I'm taking this looking yeah, by myself. It is I, what it is. Uh, Say it. I, I got a Chris Chalmers story. We went to a tournament in Sydney. Um, Jits tournament are we talking about? Or is this yes, like shoot this fighting? Was a, this was a jiu-jitsu tournament. Um, and we all... Went up on the bus. Uh, John Will's brother-in-law, uh, Glenn Barlow, shout out to Glenn, uh, was mm. driving the bus. I remember Glenn, yeah. And Chris didn't compete. I, I bombed out early. I think I got Anthony Parash in the first round and he just destroyed <laughs> me. That'll do it. Um, shout yeah, out to Anthony, the he, hippo. He, he, he will do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, Anthony ends up winning the big title. Melissa ended up having a match with Adam Kayum in the final. Yeah, wow. she, was, she would routinely compete against the men Excuse and me, the win. Because uh, they didn't have female divisions. No. The, so, well, I mean, they barely had any women training back then. Well, yeah, I think her and, and uh, a few, very few others. Uh, anyway, 
so Chris gets antsy on the bus ride home. I'm sleeping on the two seater, like so me on a two seater bus, like I'm, you know, curled up. And then I sort of stir a little bit, and I just see this shadow come from two seats away, and it's Chris jumping from the seat over somebody else onto me. <laughs> he got a little antsy. He needed to roll. He was oh pumped, God. you know. <laughs> and anyway, it turns out, you know, we're horsing around and just doing, you know, what we're doing. And Glenn goes to return the bus. Oh, no. And he is then thoroughly questioned about why there is a footprint on the ceiling of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but He's like, uh, that was here when I got here. Uh, you know? yeah. <laughs> but yeah, to your point though, Chris is a legend. And for anyone who's, he's got a... a I, I remember I the day he got his brown belt. When was that? It was in Geelong. Um, what we were, year was that? Oh, geez. Now you're stretching my memory. Um, oh, cause I met him been, when he was a brown belt. It would have been just after or not long after John got his black belt. Yeah, uh, ninety seven. Yeah, so you were around ninety seven, possibly even early ninety eight. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, I was I was there that day. I was in, I was training in Geelong that day, and uh, that was a that was that was a moment. Most of the, the the hardcore guys were that were in Melbourne would make trips down to Geelong semi regularly, not necessarily every week, but you'd still make an effort to go right. down there because Geelong was like it was kind of it was kind of like a myth if you hadn't been there. Obviously, you grew up there, but for for the Melbourneites. You know, you'd hear about, and you'd, you'd assume as well that there, it was all, it was all true that this place was amazing because that's where John's based full time. Mm. To put in context for the people who don't understand, John was based in Geelong, so he had, I don't know what what the gym was called back then. Um, good question. Was it just like JBW shoot fighting, or I, yeah. I believe that was yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a f- one of a few iterations. Yeah, that one probably fighting. lasted the longest. Yeah, um, and he, so we had at that stage, uh, we've got the gym uh, on Wangaratta Street. And John was only there once a week. Yep. Monday. So Monday Mondays. Yeah. He had his 2IC that would teach uh, on Wednesdays. So Bernie, Jenkins. Bernie Jenkins. Shout out Bernie Jenkins. He used to he used to take great pleasure in flogging us all. He did, yeah, yeah. He did. <laughs> uh, and then and then Saturday would have open mats. And the format was still the same, which was it would be advanced class first and then it would be beginners afterwards. And then usually what would happen, you, you you got senior enough to be able to do the advanced class and you usually stick around and you do the second class as well. Yeah. Uh, and then open mats on Saturdays went for about three hours. <laughs> yeah. Open mats on Saturdays, man. There's a reason I don't have open mats at my gym now and that's probably one of them. It would definitely be a contributing factor. <laughs> uh, but like, because there was, there was no one, like John wasn't there on Saturdays and Bernie usually wasn't there on Saturdays because Bernie was, uh, was in SOGS as well back then. I believe he was in training well, in training, point. so yeah, but so he was he was uh, in the, part of the training unit. But yeah. don't quote me on that; I don't know. Yeah, but he was so he's like he was in some Saturdays, but not all Saturdays. Yeah. So it was kind of like it was a little bit of like Lord of the Flies on Saturdays, man. It was well, just like, between Tyrone Cross, myself, and and a few others. So this it was like, yeah, we're we're, <laughs> we're, going, we're uh, Ryan, Ryan Harvey, yes, Dan mm-hmm. Tool. Yes. I ended uh, up in the in the crosshairs of those guys. At some point, it's because you you did have a pretty smart mouth. Back yeah, there. you're mouthy. Yeah, mouthy. <laughs> so I, I remember the conversation. I actually remember the conversation. I remember Ryan turns around and goes, "Dave, what man? Who the fuck is that guy?" <laughs> I'm like, uh, he's, "He's a new guy. Yeah, he's he's doing all right." I'm going to kick his ass. <laughs> it's like, and these these were regular conversations because. The mat etiquette was enforced by our own. And around sort of, you know, if you were, put it in context, if you were a blue belt, you were like God. Yep. Right. If you were a purple belt, oh you were God. like God's boss. Well, at this, right. at, the, at the point when <laughs> I- Levitate in. You, you so we're talking up. 97, right? Yeah. Right. 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 And at that point, there's a couple of blue belts, a handful of blue belts. There's Bernie, who's a purple, Tyrone, who's a purple- Tyrone had not yet got to purple, I don't think. Yeah, you maybe you're right. And then there was there was Chris was a brown and that was it. And that was and it. John. So basically it was the handful of blue belt and then everyone else is just white belt cannon fodder. So the mat was right. not real deep, but if you're a blue belt, like you're saying, it's it like it was you, a hard mat. You had godlike skills. It was a hard mat. And the thing is, like we I remember when the, the curriculum got split, it was when John got his brown belt. And in Kensington it happened a little earlier because we already had all the stand up in the next room. Yeah. So he was only teaching jujitsu there for a while. Uh, and 
it was at that point, like, I remember that John was a, a groundbreaker because he actually had a curriculum. He, he did, had yeah. a plan. Um, Do you remember those? The those little cards, little right? Fold that out cards. Fold out card. Yeah. Well, that was that was a few iterations in. I remember it was the many, first yeah. one, it was like, it was 18 moves. Yeah. Like 18 moves. And it wasn't 18 with variations and slices. and No, it was 18 moves. Yeah. But you got damn good at 18 moves. And when everyone started to... to figure out how those 18 moves works. 18 moves turns into about 180 moves yep. really quickly mm-hmm. when you've got a whole bunch of guys trying to murder each other the whole yep. time. So that was sort of, I remember when it went up to 24, mm-hmm. the, the, the first 24 <laughs> and everyone freaked out. I just remember that. I remember the conversation, 24 moves. How are we supposed to remember that? I mean, at the time the guys were flat out counting to 10. So <laughs> <laughs> The right. guys in the room weren't dumb by any stretch. Most, no, it's an were, interesting thing about jiu-jitsu, right? Even though the the culture then was super rough, it it, ten, it, it tends to attract intelligent guys. Tends to attract intelligent people. Who has time to remember twenty four things? Can't we just get to it? And that was sort of the the idea. Yeah. And I remember John standing at the front of the class. He goes, "There's more letters in the alphabet. Get over it." <laughs> <laughs> it's like message received <laughs> coming from a yeah. man that could recite the alphabet backwards. Backwards, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I'm, it, uh, yeah, and I, I, so back to the original thing, I, I do remember ending up in the crosshairs of those guys because I did. I don't it was, know. It was pretty funny. Yeah, I don't know what exactly what I said. I think you remember that oh better God. than me. Well, yeah. I, I, you know what? I cannot recall what was said. I just remember I think, Ryan wanting to make it. And bit I of think an it was a conversation. I think those guys overheard some of the us white belts having a conversation about who we thought was good out of the like. Oh yeah, this guy's good, but that right. guy's not so good. Oh, and God. I think. I think maybe I got overheard saying something about Ryan. Really, that's, motherfucker? That's inevitable. <laughs> that's inevitable Probably white belt true. chatter, right? That I said that's that. inevitable white belt chatter yeah. because yeah. you're trying to figure out who's who in the zoo because nobody told you. you try, well, you're trying to create the hierarchy in your head of, as well. And like, it's not a case of this guy's not good. It's just like this guy bashes me a little bit less than this guy yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that might but be it just come out of your nice. mouth that way. And it's almost like you needed, if I can get better against that guy, I means I'm getting closer to the next guy. Yeah. I'm trying to... You create your ladder right, yeah, and then you climb it. it. And... Obviously, exception was taken, and uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, but it was everyone sort of monitored themselves. And I remember there was a, at the hangar, the purple belts were like, if people, if those purple belts thought that people were starting to get a little big for their boots, mm. all right, for the next month, we're going to beat the crap out of everyone. Yep. And that was just sort of, that was the culture at the time. And it was mm. almost one of the things like John, John had his little introductions. If you didn't get an introduction, Ooh. open f- open field, right? Just everyone bash that guy. Well, right? to put in context, it's like if someone knew rocks into the class yes, and John's like- They rocked into the advanced class. So they made a point of yep. being in the advanced class. Mm. In the beginners class, it was actually pretty accommodating. Yeah. Um, uh, up until you started sparring. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, and then it, but then it was just, so like I was saying before, it's like it was the Wild West and, and the- and the but if you got this is a friend of mine like remember when you said yes. hey my friend is here yep. yeah <laughs> the it's red, like okay look after the guy the, you know, yeah. the red rag of the bull was I can wrestle oh really, oh, we, really? We, we will find out <laughs> and, and I'm pretty did. sure you can't I, t- I can't remember how long we were at at Wangaratta Street for before the hangar opened so it's that was a few years. It was because a, I, was I say, it's had probably three years. I had my one and only professional fight out of that gym. Uh, and I was going to bring that story up. So we're talking about Saturday open mats, where it's just you know, it's just crazy. It's just the the the, the kids running the shop. It was insane. So you, <laughs> Lord of the Flies, I think was the best way to put it. It's, so. It felt exactly like. And looking back again, hindsight, like Clayton and I were chatting about this sometime, and we we're like, this makes no fucking sense. So we're white belt beginners, and then you've got your fight coming up with a, bu- a couple of the other guys in Sydney or Queensland. Um, so it was in Queensland. It was on Chris Haseman's show. What was the show called? Uh, NR2. So it was No Rules 2. We're going to find that and link it up. And Ryan, uh, Ryan Harvey had nice a spandex. match. <laughs> hey, bro, I, I, rocked, I rocked the shit out of that spandex. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, but, Ryan uh, had a match Ryan well. had a match with a guy called Dominic Delaney. And I remember having a discussion because this was while we were still on Coppin Street. Yep. Um, Ryan Ryan's a wild character. You know, he... And, and we always got along very well. And I remember, okay, we're starting training. He goes, okay, I'm going to go out partying tonight and we'll start training tomorrow. And I remember we, we rocked up. I had the keys to the to the gym at, on top of Coppin Street there. And I remember 
the first lesson because he was still a bit hungover was okay we're just going to make you puke <laughs> and uh, that's, that's how I was saying but I was I was drawing on a lot of experience from um, Dana yep and Laos and and Stan and all those guys that I grew up with I mean I'm this little I was tall but I'm a kid yeah and I was training a lot you know kickboxing all that sort of stuff and I used that contact to find out who Dominic Delaney was and I found out that Dominic Delaney was a, a formidable kickboxer yep um, and I'm like, all right, man, we got to come up with a plan. And Ryan ended up coming out on top. He he yep. submitted the guy. Um, it was a rough fight, though. It was tough. And then on the next show, um, I'm like, I've got to do this. So I put my hand up for it. Tyrone Cross also did. Yep. And Elvis was on that show as well. Yep. Elvis Sinisic. So shout out to Elvis too. Um, and we ended up on that... How, like, this, this is some negotiation skills for you. Okay, what am I getting paid? 200 bucks to win. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do not manage yourself. If you're a fighter, get someone to do that for you. Right? So you're saying getting hit in the head and negotiating skills don't really go hand in hand? <laughs> let's, let's put this in a little no. bit of context. Though. How, <laughs> so you're know. having an, an MMA fight in... Queensland. Well, it was and a, a modified a, thing. It was like rings rules because gloves hadn't been, the standard glove hadn't been invented yet. No. Um, so it was no closed fist to the to the face, but you could palm heal him yep. and all that sort of stuff. You could blast the guy in the head with as hard as you wanted with a kick. Yeah. Because you had these, like they put shin pads on you, but they were just like leather socks. Yeah. <laughs> which with no padding in them. And you had like the wrestling boots on and you could, you could, you could knee a guy in the face. You could, but you can't punch him. Don't punch him in the face. That would be wrong. <laughs> but you can, you can smash people. How old are you when you're having? Nine, set, Nineteen. Nineteen. It's, that's the I mean. Yeah, it's pretty. I was a blue belt. Yep. At the time, I was nineteen, and the guy that I fought, I cannot remember his name to save my life. I just remember the size of that guy's head. Did that? Can you can you do a Google and see if that comes up on YouTube? Um. Are we done, oh, mate? <laughs> mate, we need a hotspot. No, we'll um, yeah. But uh, you were doing the training for the you guys are all doing the training for it. Yeah, and again, because well, the, the ring was set up at the back there. And yeah, there's a little corner, like a little nook, and the ring was set up by the by the window. And I know yeah. that Tyrone's training for it, and that you were in a, like and Tyrone's just rotating through partners. And somehow Clayton and I ended up in the rotation <laughs> and just getting it, fucked. It just got to the point where we started like just the, the pool's getting pretty thin. Yeah, you guys like, does anyone want to help out? And Clayton and I are just retarded. Like, so Clayton's like rugby background from Newcastle and Sydney. Used yeah, to he's, get, he's a tough guy. And he used to get in some fights and all that sort of stuff. Not me. I'm like 60 something kilos soaking wet. And I, was, I don't know anything about striking. I mean, I did Taekwondo for years. I really, I, I didn't know anything about striking. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and we're in the ring just getting flogged. And like, we thought it was cool because back in those days, it was like how tough you are. That was kind of the thing. It's like, like, like how stubborn, how much can you kind of put up with? T technique was valued, but it was only valued if you could make it work. You had to have grit. And I think you, that was... You had to be pretty... You, you had to really put your stamp on things. Yeah, But even then... Back in those days, there was no internet. We, we were getting either books or really shitty DVD instructionals. Mm -hmm. So DVDs were new there technology. Was no finesse, <laughs> there was no finesse to our technique. No. And it was go, if it's not working, go harder. Yeah. And that was a lot of what you guys, conviction got you over yes, the line. So you guys remember Pommy Dave? He was the local Pommy Dave. VHS dealer. So he was the one that would always get Valley Tudo and like Pride Night sort of stuff on yeah. VHS. You get a dub Pony, of a dub of a dub. Ponytail. Yeah, had a ponytail. Yeah, had a ponytail as well. He used to bounce well. at Revolver. That was what? him. Did he? No, 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 no. That was another guy. No, Pommy Davies, Square Joy. He had Square a judo Joel? background. Yes, he did. And he was he, he was did, tough yeah. as shit too. Yeah, he, he was, was. He was a pretty hard guy. I think his old man was out here, you know, on a working visa or or something or other. Mm. Um, but yeah, he was the guy that was dealing all the. That's how he made his cash on the side. Is he's just selling bootlegs of all these <laughs> tapes <laughs> to to us that would pay like anything to get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, man, like it's that Saturday we're just getting in the ring and we're just getting absolutely flogged but we thought it was cool as shit even though we're getting flogged because we're too stupid to realise how insane it was because again just you don't know um, but yeah we we're, we're part of the uh, the success of the Will Machado Team White team. Trash yep. uh, ruled the day yep. um, 
That was yeah, that was that was a uh, that was a Ryan and Dan special. That name. All right. So there's a story about that, which is Tyrone Cross wearing sweatbands for. Oh, I don't know where this is going. So, Ty- <laughs> so for those of you that don't know, Tyrone Cross's favorite choke is the Ezekiel, aka the cuff choke. Yeah, and for those of you that don't, cross choke was peppered in there. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. No, I should I should say it was like cross choke was his number one probably, but he was man, he was into the to the Ezekiel. I think I told this story before, but there was one Saturday where I'm rolling with Tyrone. <laughs> he choked your leg, and Ty- and you guys have a conversation between you, basically saying, "Do you think I can make him tap out by choking something other than his neck?" And he cuff choked my leg <laughs> and made me tap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah It's like a modified car crush It's like No it was my Quad Oh god <laughs> Well they're pretty small yeah, that, well, that was, And they were smaller back then Yeah Tyrone Was not only And is not only Very technical But At the time Was Extremely strong Extremely Yeah uh, he, I I remember Him choking a guy out Stan, Tony Russo Tony oh, Russell yeah. had a neck the size of a tree trunk. And this huge. guy was a massive guy and skilled. And Tyrone just walked straight out and choked him standing up. Pam Pax, I think that was. The first Pam Pax. Yeah. And everyone was like, what the fuck just happened? What was that? This the idea that someone could get choked while standing like the fight hadn't even got to the ground. That was that was like, what the hell? Tyrone just cross choked <laughs> everyone that oh, day. His, his chokes were like a hydraulic press. They just yeah. go and he just kept going and it's just there was no end to it and eventually you feel your head start and explode and the only hope you had was grab his second hand <laughs> yeah, and don't yeah, let yeah, it anywhere yeah. near you yeah. and that was limited yeah, you know? was well, a, and so one of one of the rules that we have in Jiu Jitsu is never let someone put two hands in your collar and because Tyrone was in the gym from day one for, for me that got just locked in my brain really early on because he's like man you couldn't do anything but even then it was like you're saying it's pretty hard to stop him getting the second hand in mm. he was always like he was always lifting stuff though. Like the, you know what I mean? Like there was always after class, he was always doing something to just get a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger. Very committed. But he, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you would remember better because you were there, but I'm pretty sure that he tried to wear like a, like a tennis sweatband thing that you have on your <laughs> wrist to wipe your brow into the MMA fight. So during the fight, I think he even tried to. I can't recall correctly, but I, I know he tried to wear it in there so he could try to cuff choke the guy. I don't recall. I know fight. that idea was floated. Yeah, right. That was floated. Um, I'm. I know it was was against the. It was against the rules. You, you couldn't do it. Um, it. The idea was floated. I can't recall if he actually did try it. I. He ended up beating that guy with a kimura of all things. Yeah, that's not his swag. It's it worked. He yeah. nearly tore the guy's arm off. Yeah. Yeah, it's man. It was. It was crazy. There's, oh, yeah, there's so many things that have happened back then. Oh, but a lot man. of the time, you're like, we could we could go for days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so it was about three years at uh, at Wangaratta Street, and then and then for lack of a better place, the split happened. Um, Tyrone mm. decided for whatever reason that he wanted to open up a another place. Uh, he Tyrone was a a pilot and a and a pilot instructor. He's an instructor. Instructor. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he was working out of Essendon Airport, ended up finding a facility. But he actually ended up becoming one of the first, after that, he ended up becoming one of the first uh, Sky Air Marshals. Marshals. Air yeah, Marshals. yeah. Air Marshal guys. Yeah. So, or Trolley Dolly, as I like to call them. And you, <laughs> <laughs> you, would, you would probably know better because you were closer with, with Tyrone than I was. Um, I didn't really get to know Tyrone that well until the hangar days because we ended up living there. Um, so I'm, I don't know much of the detail around what inspired him to do it. Um, but it's great that he did. So he ended up finding um, the venue that became Hangar 4. Or for a brief period, it was Combat Sports Club. Um, it was the, the Hangar 4 Combat but, Sports yeah. Club. That was the original name, oh, for, as, as so far as I can remember. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't remember the exact address, um, but that building, for those of you that... Uh, hang, we're, hang, we're hangar away. 4, we're away road. Yeah, we're away road. I actually went there. It's yeah. a jump thing now. Oh, my, my kids went to their cousin's birthday party at Jump, and it was actually there. And I, and I took... Uh, my wife on a tour is like we used to have barbecues right there yeah she goes isn't that a runway over there i'm like yeah. yes you'd be, you'd be <laughs> so rolling and a, and a plane would be taxiing it's cars like, it's, it's cool. hard for people to understand but it's literally like the, you know if you imagine a you know an oblong like mat let's say it's it's 10 meters by 20 meters and it definitely wasn't that big but at one end you know one of the short walls was all glass and outside that door was a runway with a giant DC-10 sitting out the front of it and planes taking off. And I we said had this before. a barbecue. We had this little tiny right deck and there was there. a barbecue sitting on there. And it was like literally... With, with aviation yeah. fuel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was literally <laughs> like... thought of anything. It was literally like the guile level out of Street Fighter 2. 
we need to link up a, a shot to that because it's like that. You're yes. like fighting in front of planes. Yep. Um, but it was <laughs> awesome. It was cool as shit. Uh, and then we ended up with accommodation upstairs and a bunch of us ended up living here. I think there was probably 14 or 15 or 16 of us living upstairs. 15 of us or something like that. Yeah, and that's when Muzz came into the scene when he was living in a cupboard. Yeah, he was living <laughs> yeah. He was living in a freaking broom closet or something. It was like, oh, come and on, the, like, the hangar was The hangar was epic. Now, the it, unfor- was, it was a transient... It was a home for transient grapplers from anywhere. So Tyrone was one of the owners of that. Um, uh, Lee Impey was one of the owners of that as well. He became an owner later. It was originally Tyrone Cross, John Martin, and John Wilt. Gotcha. Yes, that is right. Yeah, I knew John was involved at some point. I didn't know that Moggs was... Uh, John Martin, that Moggs was involved. You were left in Richmond, essentially. Yeah, you, you were holding down Wangaratta Street. Yeah. Yeah, so... I had never. I didn't train under Bernie. I think that was kind of he'd already kind of headed off. Well, that was when John Donahue Donahue thing happened. Because I also spent a little time there, and I ended up coming back into the fold Mm. from the hangar because I used to work in Greensboro. I was just Mm. up the ring road there. Yeah. yeah, So you were holding all that down. So So yeah. Well, because we've that that started, and I was still training in Richmond Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, and I wanted more training, so I started training Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then Fridays, but then eventually. I can't remember the space of time, but pretty much all the really good guys ended up out there and you're basically just teaching beginners. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so my move from Geelong was like, well, I'm going to train. Where's the gym? Richmond. So then I was like, right, I'm moving to Richmond. I'll Murphy work Street. Out, yeah, yeah. I'll work out how to get to work from there afterwards. It was like, oh, this is where I'm going. Mm-hmm. So I only ever trained under either John on a Monday or yep. Tyrone on a Wednesday. Wednesday. Yes, Tyrone taught Wednesdays as well. Yes, yes. that's right. Yeah, because I was that was um, after after Bernie mm-hmm. split, so it was only ever yeah Tyrone. Uh, so I was about twelve months in. Yep. And then, and then hangar started was created where John's like the ring that you guys are talking about mm-hmm. having a, because you you changed there and what yep. and John's like oh, can I can have a word to you. I'm like yep. He goes um so Tyrone sitting up seeing uh, another gym over at Essendon and I'm going to start teaching over there and Tyrone's going, do you want to teach here? And everything in my brain was going, no, 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 no. Because <laughs> I'd been a purple belt for quite 12, 15 months, 15 months, I think. Yeah. So I think I only got my purple belt in Geelong and then it wasn't soon after. I'm like, oh, John, I got a promotion to Melbourne. Uh. Well, it's also, again, I've got to remind people, this is 20 years ago. Yeah. So a purple belt's a big deal. Yeah. But you still want to be a student. Exactly. And I had never trained with the thought of being an instructor. Yep. So I didn't, honestly, I didn't want to do it, but I didn't want to let John down. Yeah. So out of obligation. He's asking you. Yeah. and But you don't feel like, it's not multiple choice on this one. Well, <laughs> well there is. I mean, there is. But, the but it's all is the same answer. <laughs> you, you, you never, you any never of these. want to say no to your coach. No. But well, the choice was, is either do this or the gym dies. Well, yeah. I suppose, yeah. And I really didn't even consider that. I was just like, I just was like, oh, well, I'll take on that responsibility. Yeah. So. Worked out pretty I well. must say, you did an excellent job. Oh, I don't know. I think you did. Oh, because well. without that. Yeah. The, the next, the the next the thing wouldn't have happened. base. That was the beginning of dominance mm-hmm. jujitsu, as it was known then. Yep, this is, this uh, would not true. have happened. Thanks, man. <laughs> no, it's. I think so, it's important, and it's. It's also, you know, like pretty much all the good guys ended up. Oh, it was a complete, and it wasn't necessarily talent. day one. Like a big chunk of them went straight away. Yeah, and I started training out uh, pretty regularly, mm. and and then ended up doing the Mondays and Wednesdays out there as well because just there are more and more good guys. I just wanted to get better. And why not? And I remember <laughs> chatting to somebody else. It might have was it Harkin. Shout yeah, out to Harkin. Harkin, yeah. Um, Hark, what a dude. He's like, still floating around somewhere, yeah, like doing some jits somewhere. Yep. Um, he, he actually, I think he still helps out Paul Matrepsky. Yeah. Um, uh, out there. But I, I, I could be wrong. It, it, it might have been Harkin. It might not have been. But there was someone who was like, dude, why don't you come and train? He's like, man, because I don't want to leave Cam out here by himself. Like, yeah. all the good guys have gone. Yeah. So I, I was just, you know, I was young and selfish and didn't give a shit. I just wanted to get better at jiu-jitsu. Um, but eventually... You know, like a big chunk of the guys went across straight away and then eventually the rest of the guys started. I noticed them like big Doug started coming and then Ollie yeah. was like, so sooner or later, everyone was just always at the hangar yeah. and the hangar ended up becoming just like, man, it, it was the Mecca in for Melbourne, Jiu-Jitsu in Melbourne. Sure. There was no other place that you wanted to train Jiu-Jitsu. Like that was the place to train. That, yep. that place produced some really great guys. Yeah. Well, you think about how many of them went on to do some pretty, like they like either 
did really well in jiu-jitsu, just generally speaking, competition, or have opened really successful gyms yep. yeah. out of that place. Yep. Um, yeah, man, it was... Uh, but you couple that with it's, the fact that... It was that a rough mat too. Very, it, very, that kind of culture carried over and it took some time for that to start to change. Uh, and I think part of it was because we were all living upstairs and you and I were just animals, just training all... Like, so somewhere in, in the hangar, you and I became really good friends and basically training partners, despite the fact that there's you know 70 kilos difference between again for the people that right. are, that are not watching this and listening to this you're six foot five six 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 120 <laughs> not anymore <laughs> um actually i'm but back I'm, then you weren't no i wasn't i'm about the same uh now as i was then yeah so i'm about 103 at the moment yes um I, I probably should have taken care of that a lot earlier <laughs> but i did actually at my heaviest i was closer to 130 yeah Oof. But I was, I was not, I, I don't feel I was technically at my best at that weight. Ooh, but yeah. you could use it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, use but it. you know what? The funny thing is a lot of guys tell me now, like my guys tell me now, it's like you feel heavier now than you did yeah. a oh. year ago. And probably the difference being though that you, when you don't have the actual kilos and you have to learn how to use yourself. Like, so it becomes a technical application rather than just possibly. But I also think I just fit into the spaces better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, it's interesting though. Like having had big guys on top of me who are jacked and big guys on top of me who are um, um, squishy. Uh, Some, portly. Supple. Portly. Yeah. The, the difference is plump. with the guys who are, who are athletic, <laughs> there's spaces to move into because of the shape of their body. But the guys who are actually quite overweight, you got... You got pinned from everywhere. It filled in the spaces on top when you were underneath. It's like having the blob on you. Exactly. It's actually yeah. really difficult to move. M like much more. Like, but the guys that are muscly and there's like there's nooks and crannies and stuff that you can work into. Anyway, we're segueing. But um, <laughs> but yeah, man. Like you're like when I started jiu-jitsu, uh, I was sixty two kilos, so I was little. Uh, and you're always you know six foot five and a hundred kilos. So yeah. and then we became basically just just training partner we're training like animals we, all the we time. hung out all the time and, and it was between us we ended up through just circumstance well taking most of the classes at the hangar we did yeah i think there was a number of things going on and one of the things was we were madly passionate about making sure that that place worked because we lived there it was everything to us as our whole lives and and let's let's say that as as great as the guys were that were apparently running it organization was not front of house was not their jam. Yeah. It was not their, it was not their strong suit. No. Uh, and we, I think we realized somewhere along the line, like I knew, so another little story, uh, you, me and John Simon after training are driving to, what was the name of that place? It's not, uh, we used to eat there all the time. Smoke and Joe's smoke and Joe's. Smoke and Joe's. Smoke and Joe's on Mount Alexander Road. That's it. We used to eat there all the time after training. And uh, we're driving there one day with John Simon and it's probably- Farmhouse chicken. Yeah. It's what, <laughs> it was like five or 10 minutes from the gym. Yeah. And uh, we're driving there one day. And so John Simon, who was John Will's first black belt, I, I need to double check that, but I'm yeah, really sure yeah, it was. Yeah, that's correct. I was there, um, saw it. And <laughs> John- It was at the Will Machado Nationals at, Foots at VUT. Yes. Gathering, yes. And so John Simon moved from- New South Wales, Newcastle as well. Um, also got into a lot of fights. I don't know what it is about Newcastle. Um, it's he, it's, he a, was, it's he a was working a, town. He was a bouncer at a biker bar while he was getting his computer science degree. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. At a, and, a, and at a gay club <laughs> where they'd often have guys coming up that wanted to go in and stir trouble. They'd go in, they didn't like 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 gay guys and they wanted to go in and... And yep. wreak havoc and John is the John, toughest, is, like, John no, is the I, toughest I, nerd I ever met. Yeah. Oh man, a <laughs> dude. And like, we're gonna have to get him on the couch one day because yeah. he was he was actually really important in a lot of ways to this this phase of jujitsu because he was really uh, he was really proactive and he was thinking outside the box a lot. So he was one of the guys that was getting these VHS copies so, uh, copies of stuff because there was a guy I can't remember his name but he would do mixtapes. Uh, so you get a tape that would have all of Margarita's matches from the Worlds on there, all of Salo's matches, and John was the one that was getting those. Uh, we would go and see your massive TV, yeah, hauling that TV up four flights of Dude, stairs. That thing you, that's how man. you know I'm a friend, bro. I know, I know, man. Because I know. that thing was remember when I broke, it was, the, oh yeah. I broke the, the rearview mirror off the Dodge Ram. We were <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Yep. 
Um, yeah, there's, oh man. But um, so John Simon moved from New South Wales to Melbourne and he starts training with a hanger and John Simon had owned his own club there. And, but he was doing his, his other work on the other side. And we're driving to Smoke and Joe's one time and I was a blue belt. So I got my blue belt and then ended up training at the hanger more or less full time after that. Mm. You're a purple belt. And I uh, and I remember saying in the car, I don't know how the conversation came up, but I'm like, I want to, I want to teach, like I want to, like I want to do jiu-jitsu full time. And John's like, <laughs> you can't make a living out of that. And um, which everyone said, which is yeah, but and for him because it's that whole thing, like you treat it like a hobby, it'll pay you like a hobby. That's exactly what was going on because he had his full time job, so of course it wasn't going to make that transition. But I remember having that conversation and just I didn't say anything kind of after that, but in my head I was like, you'll see. Like it was just like <laughs> like this is like I know that this is what I should be doing. And you and I end up having some conversations after that about how, for various reasons, that we, like, maybe we should think about opening our own the, gym. The genesis of dominance came over breakfast. Man, you I, remember I, we were at a, we had this little cafe spot, which wasn't Smoking Joe's, but it was one of those little cafes around the corner. Yeah. It was like two minutes drive. It was in Nidri, I think it was. Yep. And we were sitting down to breakfast one day. You're a blue belt, I'm a purple belt. And you know, Cam's mm-hmm. holding it down over there in, in Wangaratta Street. And we had a discussion. Yeah. And that discussion was to the effect of, well, we should consider opening up a gym. Because we were teaching a lot of the classes, if not yeah. all of them, at one point. And it wasn't because we were the best teachers. It was because we happened to be the highest graded guys in the room at the time. And yeah, you're up. Yep. And okay, fine. Um, and my only strength in that regard is I could remember stuff pretty well. Yeah. So anyway, we had agreed at that breakfast, eggs Benedict, never forget it. (laughs) (laughs) Hence Uh, the good memory. (laughs) Hence the good memory. Um, When I was a brown belt and you were a purple belt, that we should do that. Yep. I know exactly where this story is going Two weeks later, that event took place all at once. Um, well, kind of at once because... John a, Simon and I got our brown belts that day. At the start of class. At the start of class. And at the end of, end class, of class, you got your purple belt. And I remember <laughs> I remember looking at you when that happened and you kind of looked at me and we went, huh. <laughs> Funny that. Yeah. And like, I'm sure it wasn't anything that was like, obviously John didn't know anything about no. that. It just happened to be a, just a coincidence. But at that point, this is going back to something we were talking about earlier. Like John's, you would have had him as well. The little, f- he did these laminates that ended up being it? like smaller than an, than an iPhone and they folded out and had... It was like a business yeah, card yeah, size that. three folded. I wish I kept yeah, that thing, man. Sil- yeah, had the silver. Mine, mine ended up all going through the... way to the brown belt. Yep. Yeah, mine ended yep. up having the... Um, it ended up going through the washing machine. I'm shattered oh. that I lost it though because it was... Again, John was like way ahead of the curve. But every Friday night, we, before that grading, there was... I can't remember how long it was before. It was months before. We're like, mm. man, we better... Because... We better sort of nail get, this down. We, we should know this because... John being John might just pop it on us one day and we like, we got to know it. And we were drilling it every Friday, but there was things on there where we we're like, yeah. I don't know what he means by these words. Like maybe it's just, no, nah, it's not that because that's this thing over here. But some of this stuff could be interpreted a few different ways. Exactly. Which was, I mean, the, the, the list was there and the version that I may have learned two years ago might have been updated since. Yep. So there, there was, we had the idea, like, we, we got it down to the best of our ability. And we, I think most of it we nailed pretty good. Again, in, given our experience and where we were with it. And, and John's always well, John's always been my coach, but you know, at, at Wangaratta Street, he was there once a week and then moved to the hangar and he was there however frequently it was. And that started to slowly reduce to the point where, you know, because John's based in Geelong and he's got seminar circles like crazy and he's super busy. Um, mm. that And as we got to the kind of the top of the, the the tree in terms of the ranking in the room we ended up being the the leaders particularly you um john simon as well yep uh but uh yeah like a lot of our learning ended up being self-driven um which is great in a lot of ways particularly if you're going to end up in a coaching role because john was phenomenal at teaching us how to learn and teaching us how to teach but i i think the the gift that john instills in any one of his students but i feel that we were the recipients of this um, in, in almost, it's sort of like the, the water from the top of the mountain yeah. sort of idea. All three of us were always encouraged by him to pursue our excellence and it didn't matter yeah. what it was. 
if it's if it's going to happen, you, you got to pursue it. Yeah, I think my experience with John with that is even if something was to his detriment, but it was the right thing for you, he would still encourage you to do it. Yep. Um, which I think it is a, f- a phenomenal form of loyalty. Um, Absolutely, and I and me personally, I, I have. I've received that from him nonstop yep. many times. And uh, I think the only thing he really demands in return is that you're honest. Number one, that's it. There's, there's not too many people, I mean, it might sound like I'm blowing smoke and like no one's a perfect person, but I've always found that um, if you're honest with John, everything's always good. Uh, yeah, don't try and shaft him though. No, no. no. Uh, it's just, that's not going to end well. No, and he's got a lot of memory. <laughs> uh, but, so we ended up, we ended up having that conversation and then, the, yeah, two weeks later, the grading happened. We've kind of looked at each other and gone, huh. Uh, so we go out for breakfast the next day. Yeah, and we have a conversation. And one of the things that we talked about was like, well, fuck living in Essendon. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, and no, no, just to Essendon, but it was, you know, we originally we were in Richmond. Um, we... We decided that we wanted to be closer to the city, and how do we want to do it? And we're like, well, it was actually actually you you drove that idea. Yeah, you're like Dave. If we're going to do this, I reckon Richmond's the place to be. Uh, at which point I'm like, yeah, yeah, good, let's go. And then inevitably it came up. It's like, well, we've got to get in touch with Cam. Yeah, we've 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 got to see if he wants in. Yep, and. That's how it turned out. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, I, but I, I remember the conversation with you yeah. that we first had because the, the first time we spoke about it, you're like, I don't know if I want to do this. I think I actually just, I think I'm, I think I'm just a bit burnt out from teaching by myself. And I think I might just want to just hang back and just be a student. Yeah. I'll, and we were like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know if that's the best move. Yeah. Well, I know. But, but it makes sense. But yeah. So, so bring about, I, I, looking back, I didn't think I was that great a purple belt at that time. But also, never training with the idea of being an instructor. Yeah. After about twelve months, I was burnt out. We didn't have the the, the access to information that we mm. have now, so I was still doing a nine to five, living a life in Richmond, doing my thing, training Mondays and Wednesdays because it was remember it was it was shared on other nights. That map was shared yeah. on other nights, so we we're only locked into Mondays and Wednesdays. Yeah. So I couldn't expand. Yeah, yeah. If I wanted to, and I had a feeling I wanted to do that, but I was we could the the access to the mat wasn't there, and then we had our Saturday mornings, and that was kind of my life, and I was getting burnt out, and I was just, and when that phone call came, it was like I was in the desert, and you just thrown me a, a water bottle, and I'm like, yes, yes, because I wasn't too sure, but also I knew that you guys had just had that hunger. And it gave me a still to be involved, but it gave me a break. It gave me other people because you guys, particularly you, Dave, you're always so technically minded. And, and what are you and, trying to and, say, Cam? <laughs> no, no, but I, no, I, agree. I was going with, with rankings and leadership, but, and but all also that sort of stuff. no. But your reputation was always being super, super technical. Exactly, exactly. And so, and the joke was it was because you were too lazy to be athletic. <laughs> <laughs> I can never all con- jokes or have deny. a <laughs> kernel of truth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Ooh. But and so when you guys put that word out, I'm like, okay, because I'd already been thinking about expanding in a way. I don't know why burnout. It seems to be c- completely contradictory. Well, it makes sense though because you've got to, there's own that there's only one of two ways to go. You can't stay the ground, so you've either got to pull the pin, yeah. or you've got to go hard the other way. And and also like we kind of said earlier that talent drain had gone so yeah. i was kind of the top guy and then and so also my my training was suffering and i wanted yeah. to be a i wanted to also be a student and yeah. with you guys coming on board that gave me the room then to become a student again and i i still remember being teaching at one greater street and then going into i think it was one of the peter Debane's comps and got my ass kicked by a blue belt i was and there was one i was never a big competitor i was never big on, and mm. so i never really trained really hard for it i would always put my 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 entry in at the last minute like oh fuck it all right here we go <laughs> and, <laughs> and and also um just because i wasn't training with good guys to push me so i dropped off and that was where i, I was like i need i need to get 
stronger guys around There's a me. big difference between being the top guy in the room when you're a purple belt and everyone else is white belts versus being the top guy in the room. But there's a bunch of other color belts there oh, that are exactly. solid enough 100%. that if you're having a bad day and, they, and they're having a good day, yeah. something happens. Yeah, and I think exactly. you, as coaches, it's we need to be in that space because yeah. otherwise it, it, there's room for dishonesty in the in in the training space. Yep. Not intentional, right? But some of the things don't get proven. It's, it's more false. circumstantial yeah. than it is. You get away with shit because they don't know any better. Yeah. And and also, like, if you're the best in the room, my understanding of how to train with guys like that wasn't that developed. It wasn't like, well, okay, well, I'm going to let guys get to side control and I'm going to work my side control escape or I'm going to work this or I'm going to work that. You zombie about everybody all the time. Yeah, you just, you just beat them. And you're done, and that was your modality, rather yeah. than well, you know what? I'm going to train without my right arm today, or I'm yeah. just going to do this. So you would you would work on you'd mm. compartmentalize your game and work yeah. on that to improve those aspects that didn't exist back then. No, no but back that, in 2000, there was a huge benefit in that yeah. in that particular experience that you had, um, in that you were very used to teaching beginners mm. and you're far more personable than i ever was <laughs> at that time i'm look you know we all evolve and refine as as human beings as as time goes on and hopefully at, well if if you're not then you gotta do something yeah um but at that time i was still that you know i, I was very hard line about certain things and as as a consequence, not particularly accommodating. Whereas well, the the guys tend to relate to you a little more, and to you a little more. I was the I was the middle ground between you two in yeah. terms of like if you look at things on a spectrum, you, you've got brutal Dave, you've got Cam, and I kind of sat in the middle somewhere. Um, and if you if you just stop and think about what the name of the gym was, I think that really gives you an idea about how we were thinking back then because we were early twenties, we we're twenty three. Which is that? That's not a very mature age. I had nothing but shit between my ears. No, and like, so. but but we were also, <laughs> if if I was to to think about how we were feeling at the time, we were, we were quite we were quite aggressive about uh, our stance on it. Of like like everyone just needs to harden the fuck up, and we're going to train like animals, and we're going to smash everyone. Like that was the kind of vibe that we had. But, oh, but even, that was it. Even our, yeah. our first logo was mounted triangle. With the guy punching with the, the guy other guy in the punching head. Punching the yeah, other guy with in the an face. Arm wrap with yeah. a, it was just like, yeah, we were like. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. like. And that, again, that's like, that's where we're coming from back then. I remember sitting down, the, the three of us, like, and sitting down, but then also over the course of a week, like, we're pinging names back and forth yeah, to each on other. Yeah, email back and forth. Looking at the dictionary and the thes- thesaurus and like, oh, shit, that one's been registered. This one's been. And then we found dominance and we're like, ooh. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to take credit for I'm pretty sure I, because I, I remember I threw out a whole bunch of them. Mm. And I even put in dominance and I'm like, there was always that weird kind of sexual connotation to it. Like, so, oh, so well, we had a conversation to, about that though. Trust you to go there. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> why not? You know, you know, you know what the saying, I hit rock bottom and I just start digging, you know. But but I pinged it out to you guys and I threw it in like, going, uh, I don't know. And then you guys are like, yeah. I'm like, cool. Yeah. I remember having a conversation because no, thought. no, no, you're right, and no, true, and yeah. we we Thank spoke you. about it like uh, sexual like connotations. Like, no, it's a good thing because people are going to talk about it. Yeah, It'll, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I, I remember that, I remember and they, that. they'll be like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, it doesn't matter. They're talking about it because because I think it was like they'll they'll laugh until we fuck them up. Yeah, <laughs> I think basically. It was that kind of thing until yeah. they're like, uh. but our our the classes that we ran and the way that we approached training was was pretty tough back then. Yeah, uh, you know, like I remember with the classes I was running. The warm-ups being super hard, super hard. But I was doing them as well with everybody, so it wasn't anything that I wasn't willing to do. I was literally doing them. I, I, that was the key point. We were not ever asking anyone to do something that we weren't willing to do ourselves. Not willing to or, no. or, or, ca- or not capable of doing. Yeah. And it's, it's. I remember like over time, the people, more and more people just started conveniently rocking up 15 minutes late to my class. <laughs> and I was like, and it got to the point where I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Like you, you get the three or four guys who are animals and love it, but then you've got 25 guys who are just not rocking up on time. So the, the net result is not, like, it's not as good. Yeah. That makes sense. So but that, that was a learning curve for us. Yeah. Well. It's just yeah. figuring things out. It's like, well, all right, maybe you make a session for the animals, you know, once a week to get together and do the thing or whatever it is. But, you know, we were figuring it out. 
Um, so yeah, we, we had that conversation and then we all ended up kind of like, all right, let's do it. And at some point through the, the process of us starting to, to, to flesh it out a little bit more, you've decided that, no, I'm going to, I'm going to be in on this. Like I'm yeah. going to jump in on this. Yeah. And we started looking for places. Uh, right. That yeah. That's fantastic. We started looking for places. And then, <laughs> so the first place that we, the, not the first place that we found, but the place that we decided upon, Swan Street. 211A. 211A. Yeah, which was upstairs. Swan Street. And prior to us being in there, it was a Greek oh, gentleman's club. That, made, ma- that makes it sound like a, like a strip joint where yeah, they, no, where no, they really. serve you baklava. Yeah. But it's, it's not. All <laughs> which would have been cool. Probably and I think been. that's a great idea. Probably, probably <laughs> would have been cleaner. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. Probably would have been cleaner. For sure. Yeah. So just, Definitely. just great guys playing cards Smoke and smoking. Is, oh my God. And the space was not big. So the whole, the whole upstairs was 110 square meters. Um, the mat space was five by 15. It was the old puzzle mats. Yeah. Uh, and, and those puzzle mats were handpicked by Cam because someone had walked on it well, and all that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, like, because like, like we were saying earlier, with muscle and body shape, Jim, they were very much into the body sculpting and whatnot. And the girls would wear the high heels. They're in the mirrors because we had yep. these huge on mirrors the, and of the course mats, there was little yeah. Yeah, holes. stiletto holes in it, yeah. And so we, and and the the deal was that John or John gave me them. He said, "Like you're, they, they're yours to have now." Half of them were yours. Half of them, yeah, were. yeah, exactly. And the half of them were, were ours. And, and, and half those, were those George's. mats originally came from Kensington. That's how oh old God. they were. Yeah. And so we're going. Well, they're half ours and half George's. We're going to take the good ones because he's fucked up the other ones. So we cherry picked yep. all these mats. I remember George. when we were moving them. Yeah. And and there was like we were picking out like I oh, know that's a good one. That's <laughs> yeah, a good one. Yeah, yeah. And he would come in, and he would, big old guy. He go, no, no, no. You can't do it like this. He's like, nah. What you and doing, Cam, fucking? <laughs> <laughs> and, Cam, fuck? and Cam turns around and goes, "No, nah, you fuck those ones up. You keep them. Yeah, they're We're yours. These they're, ones. Yeah, yep. And, and I they, just remember, I was like, Cam, and they had nice, fake bro. tan on them and all yep. sorts of shit. Yeah, we like, weren't very nope. diplomatic back then. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, or stealthy. He, even, even like Cam, when you said that to him, it was just like I didn't. I thought. <laughs> Okay, we're going to get into it here. I'm and Cam a, just put his foot down mm. and was like, I had never seen George shut up so quickly. Yeah. I was like, oh, oh, okay. Whoa, okay. He goes. <laughs> cool. Uh, but um, yeah, so we ended up finding that place. And in the process of that, we're trying to figure out, well, we've got rent. I remember so our our lease for there was, I think it was $14,000 a year. It was pretty cheap. Was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, some yeah, been, like, been like, even then, that would have been like, but holy cow. We're, you know, we're 23 years old. I, yeah, I have no money. A little bit older. No, yeah. And we, you loaned the business some money for yes. something. Oh, I, I still the, remember the bank of my, Cam my, was my girlfriend at that time was like not wanting to loan the money mm-hmm. and like making sure that the business paid it back. I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. You know, yeah. anyway. But it was, I remember it being nerve wracking. busted. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. super nerve wracking when, when we signed the lease. So I remember it's all just shitting our pants going, fuck, what if it doesn't work out? What if it doesn't work out? Yeah. Uh, but we, we ended up kind of getting together with the students in Richmond and, and basically like, hey, this is what we're doing. And we sold a couple of um, paid in full memberships for X amount of time up front. And that gave us a little bit of cash to do our renovations. And then we moved them over to direct And the rest of them. Whoa. So, well, to put it in context though, that Cutting back then edge, everyone man. was just paying, like, ca- what was the casual fee? It, I, was, I was thinking about this the other day. I think I had, Seven tw- bucks. I had, 20, no, I had 20 students and I think it was $40 a month. Yep. So it ended up being about $800 a month. And yeah, and John and I split that 50 50. Yep. Yeah, so it was around those figures. Yeah. And I remember we got, we did the math and we like, we need 18 of them on there to, to pay the bills. Yep. And or to, to 18 on direct debit to pay the bills. And we got 18 of them exactly. Yeah. And then we're like, oh, thank God we're not going to go bankrupt. Well, during, during that time as well, um, I'm sure you would recall this. I remember like it was time for us to announce. Yep that we were going to be moving on because we had, you know, we, we spoke to Tyrone, we, we spoke to, to Lee, who was then, you know, uh, a partner in the hangar and everything. And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah well, you know, you got to do what you got to do. But I don't think they expected us to convey to the students of the academy that we were, were going to be moving on. Yep. And because we were taking like pretty much all the classes at that point, that they would notice that if in two weeks' time we weren't there. Yeah. And that's where it came from. And we, we sat the guys and I was like, guys, look, it's it's all good. Like, there's no issues. But, you know, Dave and I are going to be opening a place in Richmond and, you know, you're welcome to visit if you want kind of thing. That 
We were very explicit though about not approaching any of these students right. proactively to come and train with us. We, we never had any conversations prior to opening. The no. one exception that I'd say is like Murray just moved across from New Zealand. Murray and my uncle Jeff. Yes. And and they were yeah. they were they were going like literally it was like a week before we we're gonna open mm. and we're like, just wait a week before you sign a contract. Why, why, why? I'm like, just wait a week. <laughs> right. Just just hang in there so, for a little bit. So because we knew obviously your uncle Jeff. Uh, yeah. And his son. Uh, Daniel, yeah. Yeah. And Muzz was like, he'd been across for some trips before. And, and, we were, and Murray hung out with us. Yeah. And so we're like, just the only reason was don't sign a contract so you have a choice. And if they, if they wanted to choose to stay, that's fine. But like, well, that was their choice to make though. Exactly. But we weren't going to drop the announcement early because no. at, of course with anything someone's not supposed to know, like people aren't supposed to know, naturally everyone will know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So we we then did that, and that I I remember there was there were some people that were not happy about that announcement um, from management. They were just like, "Well, how could you do that?" And I was like, "No, you you weren't there. You didn't hear it. But this is exactly what was said." Mm -hmm. And that was not helped by the fact that when we did actually move, a significant portion of the students ended up coming with us. A lot. Yeah, a lot of them came across. And again, I think that's because we were we were teaching most of the classes. But we're but also unless you lived out there, which a lot of guys will live closer to the city. Mm. So unless you lived at like on the far side yeah. of the hangar, yeah. you know, with reference to Greater Melbourne, it was it was just as easy to go to Richmond. Yeah, if not easier. Yeah, like in those days traffic was completely different too. Oh right, <laughs> yeah, you could yeah it's get around there. But it is one of those things of, of, of you. The owners of the gym weren't particularly present at that stage no they, they had not. other things going on so tyrone's doing his his thing he's got other jobs you know it was he was his side hustle for lack of a better phrase right um lee was doing whatever he was doing but we were we were in the gym 24 7 we were kind of almost running the front of house by default um right when someone came buses. in they spoke to us yeah we weren't being paid for anything either well no. correct me if i'm wrong because what would happen with prior to class you'd roll yeah. and then it'd be like well it's six o'clock oh shit no one's here Highest belt, yeah, done, and that's, that's and pretty course, much how it was. Yeah, and yeah. of course it was that it was just. Then after a while, it kind of it kind of ended up being. Uh, I guess we just expected that that this is kind of how things were running, and yeah. I know that we had conversations at some point. We're like, we need to make sure that this thing keeps running because if it doesn't, we're not going to have any train. We're not going to have anywhere to go. And that was, I think, one of the things that prompted us to go. Well, there's two things. One was, well, let's open our own place because of that thing that happening, but also because this is what we should be doing. Like we, we realized man, we should be running a gym and teaching and like, this is, we're super passionate about it. The, the ball is already rolling. Yeah. You're let's already doing it, it. Let's get it rolling to uh, <laughs> yeah. some, some advantage. But we yeah. made, we made that announcement and yeah. And then and very, very shortly out, almost immediately after that, I think it was on our last night that we did it. Yeah. Uh, and then shortly after that, we, we opened up, um, 211A Swan Street. It was dominance yeah. jiu-jitsu and shoot fighting. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, Cam was Cam was holding the shoot fighting down. Yeah, still, you know, it was important. Well, at that time, I, I it, thought the it was to fight to keep the appeal open for everything. We right. did right because we knew back then. Again, so this is as it says on the hoodie, 2002. So this is still early, man. Like this is too if, God. If, if I had a dollar for ago. every time I went to a party <laughs> or met <laughs> someone, they go, "So what do you do?" Or you know just normal conversation I, I do bjj and they're like what's that um it's it's fighting but it's on the ground and you just see this glaze go over the, like what? the fuck it? and and then you and then trying to explain it and then also trying to share the enthusiasm like it's just awesome you get to do this and that and blah blah, blah. and they just go uh-huh they would walk away uh -huh. going, this and guy's lost it crazy person yeah. and i was just like oh Which, yeah and I, I think most people are, are at least vaguely familiar with jiu-jitsu now because yeah. of mma but it's still one of those things where it has to be experienced to be understood. Yep. Even if you you watch it, you still can't get it. And uh, it's even worse trying to explain it with words. It just doesn't work. But uh, Yeah, but I think now because there's so much information, you, you know, you Google BJJ and you've got YouTube videos and, and even things like the docos that Stuart Cooper does and guys yeah. like that, where that alone sells it. Yep. You're, like, you're just like, oh, that... And, 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 and just the, um, the narrative that they construct. Yeah. Is, is none, of, none of that existed. existed. So how do you do that? How do you? No, so my that? my sale, my background in 
my nine to five job. So before I was doing jiu-jitsu, I was a corporate slave wearing a suit and all that sort of stuff. But the very first job I had was for Clayton, who was the guy that got me to do the first class with him. And who, we, who, who was one of our first students? One of our first students. So we became friends. He was in a martial arts, realized that I was in a martial arts. We'd, we'd seen the UFC tapes and we were trying to find it, but we couldn't. So we ended up just trying other stuff. And we ended up doing some Kung Fu lessons in the city. <laughs> and I remember like, like literally afterwards, I was like, I was like, man, it was on like the second story or something. I was like, dude, walking up and down the stairs was harder than the class. Like, what the fuck are they like? <laughs> and that like, might've just been the class. It might've just been technical. It might've been like, I think we did two classes and we're like, all right, what's the point? No, no disrespect to Kung Fu out there because it just wasn't what we're looking for. Yeah. Um, and we did a few other bits and pieces. We, we caught up some ninjas as well. And <sighs> just, when I say the, caught the, them up, the we kind of pranked them a bit. That, that, that's a podcast in itself. We'll have to do that, that one day. But um, yeah, you were there for that too. That was fun. So yeah, like it, my, Clayton owns a company back then called Advanced Fitness and they did sales promotions for gyms. So if, if back in the day when people had landlines, if you ever got a phone call going, hey, we've got this gym special, come on down. I was a telemarketer, then I was in the gym doing gym sales, like the person that would two of you, and then I you know, worked my way up th- over the course of a year through different roles. When that job finished, because Clayton fired me, um, <laughs> we still <laughs> remain good friends though, but basically because in between promos, if, I, if there wasn't a job for me to be on, he'd be like, all right, you can come back into the office and you can just, you know, I'll give you some hours doing stuff so you've still got money coming in. But I was a bit of a distraction. Um, yeah, because you were mates as well, so you'd fall Yeah, really? so like we'd shoot the shit and I'd distract really? other people and he's like, look, no. dude. And when he's, <laughs> it was like, yeah, all right, fair enough. That, that, was, a, that, was, <laughs> yeah. that was about how I, I reacted. Call. So, but that actually freed me up to start training because all the work for him was in the evenings because that's when people would come into the gyms and get to it. Um, so that's when I actually started training properly. So I did my first class, did a couple other Saturdays, I think, in between, but then he fired me and then I started work, uh, training properly. And then once I'd started, it was, it was on. But uh, that job that I had for him set up the front of house and the systems that we use. So back in the day, we were way ahead of the curve for how we actually approached the front of house. Um, Cam actually built the front desk at the top of the stairs. At an MDF. The of stairs, yeah. At an MDF. Yep. Yeah, the, yep. had the, that but there. A, the, one of the things, the reason I, I raised this because I was responsible for most of the sales and sales calls and, and that we all kind of had our, we had our teaching roles and then we had our, our business roles. Uh, and mine was the, the sales side of things because of, of my experience and that worked really well. Um, but one of the things that we would encounter a lot of the time is we were having to actually explain to people what jiu-jitsu was. So in 2002, and even for the, for the next few years, no one knew what the hell it was. So they were actually coming in to, they, they knew they were interested in martial arts, but they didn't actually really know what shoot fighting was or what jiu-jitsu was. So that was a pretty interesting time to be around because now everybody, like you, you don't even, have to worry about that. Even now part of though, even now, it is still relatively specialized knowledge. People yeah. know it exists, but they don't really know what it is. No. And to a, a parent, for example, enrolling their child, they're just, okay, white pajamas, karate, right? You know, like there's, there's still there's still a little bit of a disconnect. For some, there definitely is. I'd yeah. say in general, the market knows what jiu-jitsu is a lot better because so many people watch the UFC yeah. okay. and they go, oh, it's the thing Absolutely. on the ground. So they get that. And when, if someone doesn't know and you go, have you ever seen UFC? And they're like, yeah. And you're like, all right, so the, the bit when they're on the grounds and they're like, yeah, I'm like, there that's, you go. That, yeah, and, that, and you, that can, without you the can make a you can make an approximation. Yeah, yeah, and that most people will get now. And some because what's happening on the ground, there's different versions of jujitsu. So we've got self defense jujitsu, um, we got sport jujitsu, you know, and that that kind of falls into a few different kind of subcategories. And then you've got just for lack of a better phrase, recreational. Um, but what's happening on the ground in MMA is, is an approximation of all those, mm. uh, and obviously some of the details around it, it's like a Venn diagram, right? Like there's crossover on all of those, but then there's there's bits of it that don't. But uh, yeah, we were we were spending a lot of time actually educating people, but we made the decision pretty early on. We need to have shoot fighting because we need to have some appeal to people that don't really want to do jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. Um, like the, the whole tackling people, throwing them on the ground, sitting on top yeah. of them was, and and still, it's 2002. It is not now where there's like a, a lot more structure as to how a beginner of like from coming in the door yeah to being introduced to jiu-jitsu in a, in a nice way yeah that didn't exist no and over the years we started to build those systems in and it's got to the point right. where now almost every gym that you oh maybe i shouldn't say that because i don't know every gym but i would suggest that most gyms that you walk into have some sort of beginner program there is there yes. is a there's a line that's drawn between the people that 
that are considered to be beginners and the people that are considered to be experienced. And that line might be at blue belt. It might be at first stripe. It might be at 10 Wherever the line lands, there's still a line. Exactly. But uh, those those ideas kind of came into play. You know, we had different ways of, of... bringing beginners into the group that worked really, really well, depending on the size of the gym. For a, for a while, we are doing 30-minute private lessons to help people. But as the gym got bigger and busier, that became harder and harder. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for, for for the first few years, it was trying to explain to people what jiu-jitsu was. Um, and it wasn't a long... And then, and then should they have walked upstairs during one of the classes where the more advanced guys were rolling? Yep. It was almost as if you had to calm them down to explain to them what was actually If we happening. had a dollar for every time someone, you'd see this head come up, and, and 180, just, and go back just, down. Just the head, because there was like, the, it was a sunken staircase. Was, yeah. So you just, uh, uh, they look, and no. they go, okay. <laughs> and the stairwell was set on the, like, the hard left wall of the building, and then you'd walk up to the stairs, and then directly in front of you, like there's a couple of meters of landing, and then there's the, the desk. Uh, there was about a meter between the, not even that, a meter between the so desk tight. and the and the mat. So, so tight. It was six hundred. I think it was yeah. a six hundred mil yeah. walkway. And there's yeah. the rail for the stairs uh, on the right. Obviously, the I remember stairwell Murray, and the mat. Murray Five by fifteen. Smashed his foot into it in the first week, and then we had yeah. to. We figured out. We figured out that we had to pad a metal surface. <laughs> yeah, crazy, right? Uh, and that was amazing. Put, put the wood across the window, <laughs> the rails. Yeah, yeah. So that no, so one, no one would fly no out, one out the window out on Swan Street. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we padded the thing. We were, you know what? What if someone falls out the window? <laughs> yeah, just some timber. But it was—it sounds crazy now because places are like are so much more switched on to things like OH and S. Um, but we were figuring that stuff out as we went because yep. there just wasn't that many gyms around, and no one was doing it professionally. I shouldn't say no one. I'm sure there's people that were. There were professional martial arts schools, but as far as what we were doing with jujitsu, there yep. were very, very few. Yep. And I remember having, you know, the, the old, you can't make a living doing that. And I just remember one of my uncles asking me what I was up to. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm currently doing this. And he goes, oh, you can't make money doing that. And I remember being super dejected about it. And then a few years later, he's, he asked me at a family gathering, are you still doing that jujitsu martial arts shit that you're doing? I'm like, Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can't make money doing that. I said, yeah, right, you can't. I am, so <laughs> yeah. stay out of my and way. I, I think that's the, the a really good way to put it is you can't. Right. You're not the right person to be like, and that's fine, but there's plenty of people that can. Yeah. Um, Don't interrupt me while I'm getting business was, done. You know? exactly. we, were all quite, we were quite conservative or cautious when it came to money, which is actually a really good way to start out business because you don't want to be frivolous when you... Don't really know what you're doing yet. You don't want to be throwing the. But we paid off all of our debts, and you were running all the accounts then. Um, and I remember the the first the first moment we were like, we've got some money to actually divide, and we we're like, what the fuck? Like, we that, just we didn't happen, pay. and it was it was within a year too. It was, yeah, yeah it was, and, but it was a significant moment because that that moment where we actually had some money to divide was like, we're succeeding at this, like we're we're doing this, we're getting ahead. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy, and then over time, that just grew and grew and grew. I think we were at Swan Street for two and a half, three years. Yeah, around that. About two and a half, three years. Yeah. And we started there with the 18 members and we left there with 84. Oh, you remember that? Yeah. I wow. remember. There you go. Yeah. I remember. But that was, that was, that was, that was hard going too, but. It was the, slow, the, man. It was the, a grind. Now, like, is, to put I it in context. Our retention rate was actually very good. It was quite good. Hard to get, but we kept them. Yes. Yeah. And I think it was because of we learned some lessons from what it was that we'd experienced coming through um, Wangaratta Street and the hang on all those sorts of things. Um, we, were, we were a bit more switched on to the business side of things. Shoot finding was an easier in. For example, my sister trained back then yep. and she tried to do the jiu-jitsu classes a couple of times and hated it, but yeah. she really liked the shoot fighting. Yeah. Um, at some point, I don't think it was that... No, it was before we transitioned. We went. For, we decided to move away from shoot fighting because I think you were kind of a bit over-teaching it. Yeah, yeah, I think and so too. I think... The even the the people in the shoot fighting class because there was a ground requirement. Yeah, they ended up sort of drifting into the jujitsu class. That's kind of what our plan was. And then once yeah. they sort of made that transition, yep. they weren't going back. No, and it's not through lack of um, engagement in the content. It was just. This demands a lot more of my attention. I think that's yep. what it was. I don't know, but 
Yeah, is, is, it's. I feel like you're right. There's there's that like jiu-jitsu has more depth to it. It tends to be more engaging because of the chess game, um, and you tend people tend to fall generally speaking into one or two camps, and it's it it ends up becoming one of these things like, well, are we doing groundwork or are we doing striking? Let's choose. I think that's the kind of the way it ends up falling in most people's heads. Like, well, if we're doing striking, let's just do striking. Or yeah. if we do, you know what I mean? I'm not mm. saying that's the way it should be or not. I'm just saying that's the way it tended to end up gravitating. I, I think it's also easier for anyone to become good at one thing first. 100%. And it's also easier coaching too when you divide the, the, the knowledge into those categories that you're trying to give to somebody. Um, so at some point, I'm going to say about two years in, but I could yeah. be wrong. Yeah. We've gone, all right, let's, let's start to transition this. And that's when we decided, well, what's the best striking arts out there? Muay Thai. Yeah. Like that was at the top of the list. So we, we went on the hunt for a, um, for a Muay Thai coach. I think it was, um, uh, is it, was it Amanda? We called Amanda Buchanan. Amanda, who, who was the Cannon Buchanan? Yeah. Mm. So she was a beast, and she'd done some some she classes at the, the hangar. She was at the Underworld at yes. this time. She was like before the Underworld sort of changed hands. But she taught a couple of Muay Thai classes at the hangar. Yeah. Um, and she was an she was an animal. Just that, like what she was. She was tough, man. What would she be? 50, 60 kilos. Oh, soaking wet. But just a, a monster, like just awesome striking. And she'd fill in a couple of classes. I'm like, man, I didn't know that much about striking because it was never my thing, but you guys were much more dialed into it. So she ended up at the hangar and then we ended up calling up her going, hey, we want to start running Muay Thai classes. Um, and then she ended up recommending someone who was with us for the first however many years. So when we transitioned from that space on Swan Street because we grew out of it, um, we and ended it was, up- It was Bridge Road. It was Bridge, Bridge Road. Road. So it was the corner of, of, of Bridge and Church- there was a gym uh, in, so this Richmond Plaza was, it's been knocked down now. So if you drive past it, it's just oh, a giant really? hole yeah, in the ground. Yeah, I went past there the other day. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. That's, yeah. Um, God, so there was some history in that place too. Oh, yeah. I got nuts. my black so, belt on that map. Yep. Yep. So the, that space that we ended up going into, there's a gym in that that was called A1 Fitness. Um, and uh, we ended up subleasing what was their group fitness room. So they'd rejig the space and it had this big room that was was empty and we ended up subleasing it off them and we got to share the change with the showers and toilets and stuff. We had our own entry. It actually worked out great. It was really, really, really good. Oh, so we had space. one one yeah, big mat. The, find. And our yeah. own entry straight out onto Bridge Road. Yeah. So it was yep. And the mat was 220 meters, which was for them was big. That is a, like it's huge. The the mat was sort of massive. massive. Yeah. Massive. Really, yeah. really big. But we just clear span. Oh. We just had the one mat and yep. but it was, you know, the it was I was going to say indoors. Of course it's indoors, but it was, you know, air conditioned and all that sort of stuff. So it was pretty there comfortable. Was, there train. was sunlight. Which reminds <laughs> me actually, which reminds me. And the, in 211A, when we were doing really hard training, which was most of the oh, time, yes. and you'd walk up the stairs and you would walk into a haze of sweat. Literally, it was like, it was like the fog on Dagobah. Like you just walk and it's like, <laughs> right. you're like, it was, and it was it'd probably go about a meter high. It was nasty but, but also we should circle back to when we first took the place over with the old greek men oh the walls were yellow and we got this guy in that was training over at hangar andreas i think it was yep painter yeah he's a painter and we're like just seal it out just because you, you'd never get the walls clean well, you would what, never get them we had to sugar soap it we, first we sugar soaked oh, it and i remember whoa. i remember <laughs> right. being being jittery as shit because I the was, nicotine you're absorbing it into we had yeah. rubber gloves on right but when you do the sugar soap and you're scrubbing the walls down, it's dribbling down my arm. <laughs> yeah, and I'm dribbling down my arm, and I, I remember I was sitting at lunch with you guys. I'm like, guys, I don't, I don't feel good. <laughs> I think, I think I equivalent like a nicotine <laughs> patch myself with about a hundred cigarettes they, all they at once. Chain smoking from that day. <laughs> You've never been I, the same. I've never smoked in my life. I still don't, of course. But I was just like, guys, I feel sick. I don't feel good. And they're like. No, nah, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And yeah. it's like, it's yeah. like you know what it was? It was you'll be right tomorrow. It's the, it's the freaking liquid it was disgusting. nicotine like, that it was when going we say, through my skin. When we say it was yellow, we mean it was yellow. It was, it was like, like a dark brown, brown, brown it was disgusting. Tan, and it was foul. And we sugar soaked it as best as we could, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> so then there, were limits. Said, there were limits. <laughs> he was spraying it. He didn't have any breathing gear on and he was high as shit. Yeah. Small. Because <laughs> we were eating, we were having dinner over across at one of the great restaurants. That the t- yeah. And he's up there going hell for leather, just sealing, just fucking hiding it yeah. away. It was hectic. And he then when it did get sweaty, when it got sweaty, 
and the sweat going to the walls, and you'd start to in get the vents yellow. Yep. In the vents in the roof. <laughs> yeah. It would drip. It was disgusting. There was disgusting those yellow shit. And it was just yeah. spray everything, just oh. seal it out. I remember just when he came downstairs after that, we're like, how'd you go? He's like, huh? <laughs> what? And he was chroming like the whole time in this enclosed space. <laughs> oh I'm my surprised gosh. he didn't yeah. pass out. Speaking you know? of OHS, man, no masks or anything. Oh, These guys are nuts. None of that shit. Yeah. That, it's like that's basically it was put plastic on anything you don't want painted. Exactly, that's it. And he just went in and just... just he he might as well have put a bomb in a bucket of paint and just, <laughs> just <laughs> let it go. Because that's what I had to do. There's no, yeah. That space was quite small, so the ceiling was, was just normal, like 2.4. Yeah. I could reach and touch yeah, it. Yeah, it wasn't very high. So and we then went, went the building's not very wide and it's not very deep. So 110 square meters, low ceilings. So there's not a lot of cubic meters in there. And when the space got really hot, it just, the air wouldn't oh. circulate, it just get heavy. And we would have to no, very... There's little slide windows. There was like two of them. <laughs> and because the, the, the moisture windows. would all end up obviously just gathering on the walls. And we would end up having to sugar soak the walls regularly because of the mold from all the sweat oh. and filth. It was pretty nasty. And and then we went over to Bridge Road, which was just lush. But yeah, Bridge Road was pretty rad. It was like... A, a, Beverly Hills just opened up, you know. Yeah, it was man. Amazing. Yeah, it was it was pretty rad, and that arrangement was good. And we, so we, when we moved across there, by that stage we'd made the transition. So now we've got jiu-jitsu and we've got uh, Muay Thai, yep. uh, and the Muay Thai was was ticking over pretty well because everybody in and, Australia and, and the start of MMA because Rev yeah. was with us at the time. He yeah. he came to um, I think it was his first trip over. He ended up visiting us in yeah. a little place, and yep. then the transition happened, yep. and he came yeah. with us. Yes, he did. Uh, you can. Someone posted a, a screen cap of his footlock instruction that he released through Jeremy Takoti's black belt. When my, uh, belt when studio. my, I think it was my knee popped on that particular <laughs> <laughs> recording, and I just remember I think Jeremy even slowed it down, click, and yeah. Rev's face went, <laughs> <laughs> and I went, "We're recording, keep going." Uh -huh. right? <laughs> I guess it works. That happened with Huron or Henna, didn't it? You were doing some... with Henna. Yeah, you yeah. doing <laughs> click. <laughs> like, it's like ah. click, and he just went. I'm like, I'm good. Don't worry about it. You know? <laughs> Been there, done that. It's all injury. It's, it's happened before. <laughs> Just repeating history. But yes, yeah, about was funny. it was somewhere between two and a half and three years that we transitioned from. From I'm going to have to say three years because it we would have been on a year by year lease. Something I like think, that. Yeah. I yeah. think the first in the first lease at, at Swan Street, it was two years with an option for one. Yep. To to extend for one. And yeah. I don't think we the extension we just happened. We just going month up. by month. Maybe yeah, that was yeah. it. But yeah, we ended up finding the place on the corner of Bridge and Church and uh and then kind of moved the gym across and we had the bigger mat so we could kind of split. And the it was at the quality mat too. It, it was, was laminated with the shout out to Theo at uh, TKK Sports, who is actually padding the uh, the concrete columns in the gym very soon. Yeah, the the with the vinyl. Vinyl type. yeah. So prior to that it was all just jigsaw Jigsaws. puzzle mat. Like those foam things that were just like yeah, a... So you, you know, it would be nothing for, you know, several people to break their feet in there. Yeah. yeah. Just, just like a, little toes dislocated all the time. Just oh, a yeah. sponge. But we, yeah, oh. we were one of the first gyms to actually do a, a, a professional mat, you know. With, yeah. with wall padding. Wall the pads, the all that. Bit. was great. Yeah, the, the blue seat was great. Um, and then even the signs on the window, it was that sticky stuff on the window. And John Remember, Kappa, was, John was, Kappa was modeling the, uh, you yeah. were modeling the gi one. So and John a, Kappa did the, yes, did the, the uh, shoot the no one. one. Oh, sorry, the Muay Thai one. But, yeah. And it was the stuff that would go on tram windows where it had the little holes in it. So yeah. you could still yeah. see out you of could it. still see out. Yeah, but from a distance, it was a, a solid image. I think your stance was something like, Rah. It was a wrestling stance. <laughs> yeah, it so but it kind of looked like a creepy kind of gropey yeah, stance as well. I'm going to touch you where I shouldn't. But like some of that, you don't, kind of realize some of those things until they're blown up life-size. <laughs> well, actually, like, bigger than life-size. They were a massive and, window. And also, I suppose already. it's still kind of... It, it made sense to us, but yep. no one... Had to, someone had to, no, <laughs> no. Someone who was driving walk along, was like, walk along Bridge right, Road buying shoes and look up and go... Yeah. <laughs> There's so many bad, so many bad images in that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, context, <laughs> but hey, hey, this, oh, oh man, it'd be good if we had a photo of that. Oh, you know man. that that you know, there's some of my my fondest memories, just in just in my jujitsu career, came from that time. That space was was something. Yeah, it was something, and it was because yeah. of the people that were in it too. So again, John Simon was a really big fixture of the space then. So he yeah, was at yeah. the hangar. Uh, I keep mentioning him because I don't think. Because he's not actively in the scene now, people don't realize how how important he was in the people who are in the scene now. Their journey, I think, on and off the mat, yeah, yeah. as well. He's yeah. he's a very good friend, yeah, nice to to a lot of people. had his head screwed on. Like and he was he was a bit older. He'd been around a minute. Yes, you know he he like we we're all like someone said what 
that's it. I'm going to go and murder that guy. Yep. And, and that's the thing. That actually <laughs> did happen. There, there, were, there were moments where, okay, we've got to pay this school a visit. And that was early in the piece. Yeah. You know, so it was like, we've got to pay this school a visit. We've got to, we've got to throw down. We've got to, it's like, and John would be the guy's like, that's what are you doing? Yeah. Talk that shit. Yeah. And we won't have to cry no more.